All right, here we go. Jason Lee, at long last, welcome to Vlad TV. Thanks for having me. I mean, you actually go back. We do. Like four or five years? We do. I mean, you know, you're an OG in the game. You know this shit more than we do. So I always try to pull on people who have the experience that I don't have, and you've clearly been doing it. Well, I've always done this, whether it's Charlemagne, uh, Adam22, Sean Cotton from Say Cheese, uh, and yourself. I look for people that are starting to buzz and really look like they're really serious about this craft. I try to reach out to them early. And you're yeah. one of the people that I've done that. You know, when I first saw you kind of popping, I called you. We started to meet up. We had like a couple lunches and or actually dinners. We did. We did. We did some dinners, kind of had a little media, a little group. And I rem I'll never forget in that dinner you said to me, and I always laugh when I think about that dinner. You said it was me, you, and the owner of Hip Hop DX. And you right. said, have you ever been sued? I'm like, nah, I've never been sued. The hell you mean I've been sued? I think you hexed me because I literally <laughs> got sued every week after that dinner. Um, and I've been sued so much, but I've learned a lot in the lawsuit. So. I mean, it comes with it. Yeah, it is. It, it just comes with it. When you do this type of work at a high level, lawsuits just come with it. At first, it freaks you out and you're like, oh, no, I'm going to you know, oh, now become I'm, bankrupt. Yeah. And then you're like, okay, it's just like anything yeah, now else. Now I'm like, what's for lunch? What's okay, for lunch? You know. <laughs> Past asparagus. <laughs> well, this is your first time here, so I want to start in the beginning. And I realized until actually doing the research, I didn't know your backstory, and it's quite an intense, yeah, quite an intense backstory. So I want to start in the very beginning. So you were born and raised in Stockton, correct? And you had a white mother and a black father, correct? But they were never married. They were never even, I don't think, in a relationship. Yeah, yeah. and in fact, your father was married to someone else. And is still married to that same woman. Right, and he had seven kids? Out of that marriage, and two yeah. with her, yeah. So he had more kids with other women than with his own wife. Correct. Okay, and uh, your mother is Italian Greek. Yep. Your dad is African American. Correct. Um, but your mother actually had a very uh, rough upbringing. Uh, I guess she was raped by her own father? She was molested by her father for years and abused by her mother. Um, her mother didn't believe that she was molested by her father. And I think that caused a lot of her early onset psychological stuff. And then of course she spiraled into drugs and she had a very difficult life. Okay. Do you remember when you first started seeing the drug use and, and being aware of it? Yeah, I mean, you know, when you're young, you're raised with your family, things seem normal. But then again, when you look back, you don't really know what normal is because that's all you know. I mean, we had Christmases, we had Easter's, we had birthday parties, we had the cakes, we had the clowns, we had the gifts. And then the gifts stopped coming and then the toys start being sold and then you lose your apartment and then your mother loses her job and then you end up in foster care. So, you know, I, I do remember the early years when she started to get... Um, heavily into drugs and her first drug was cocaine and then it was heroin and then eventually crack and you know during the crack epidemic back in the um late 80s early 90s i mean i just there was no coming back from that you know and so yeah i i remember early on when things were good and then when things were not good she actually became a prostitute at one point to, to feed her drug habit she did and you actually saw her in bed with a client i did that was, um, you know, we I'd see people come in and out of the house. Um, ironically, I met my first trans person was this woman named Sparkle, and who was her friend, who somehow was staying with us too. It was really weird. But I remember just seeing so many different people around. And then when we got kicked out the apartment and we ended up in a motel, I still used to run the streets a lot. And I was only seven, seven, eight at the time. But when I came back that one time that I talk about in my book, God must have forgotten about me. She had somebody there and. And uh, she wasn't happy that I walked in on them. And I became, you know, the, you know, I became the enemy, I guess, at some point, because she just didn't like the fact that I was disrupting her program. But yeah, that was, that was interesting. Yeah. And I guess you started to steal from dead people at funerals. Well, I mean, I wrote in the book that part of survival, I mean, think about it. I was a latchkey kid. I had no present father. My mother would leave me at home to take care of my sister who was three years younger than me. So if I'm seven, she's four. When I was six, she was three. Um, we had babysitters who were abusive. I remember one of our babysitters just would go there and sleep. One of them burned my sister's uh, thumb on the stove because she used to suck her thumb. Um, and so I, we were left by ourselves. So in order for us to be able to survive, we had to be able to get money. And one of the things um, where I lived in Stockton on the corner of um, Sutter and Park was right around the corner from three funeral homes. 
And so we would go to the funeral homes and we would take the jewelry off the dead bodies and then we would sell it in the hood. Um, and that was, you know, I, I felt like that was the most innocent way to do it. But I still from dead, I don't still now anyway, but I mean, it was, I guess, I don't know, for me, it was survival. And uh, that's what, that's what I did. When I guess at seven years old, you saw a guy get stabbed to death. Yeah. Um, so there's a, there, so right across the street from two of the funeral homes is, um, a liquor store, Cal Park Liquors. I remember my mom saying, go to the store and buy some milk. I'm like, okay. So I went to the store to buy milk. And this guy got into it with another man in the store. I was in the back getting the milk and I heard the struggle and the tussle and all that. But when I came out, there was literally blood everywhere. And the man had um, stuck him in the neck. Um, and, and from what I recall, he had stuck him and was like sawing at his neck. And just the blood was like everywhere. I literally just ran out the store with the milk and went home. What does that do to a seven-year-old seeing that? I mean, it was traumatizing. First, I didn't really understand it because, you know, I, we didn't have movies that, back in the day that were that gory that we watched, you know. Um, I, I didn't really understand it all. Um, it was definitely shocking um, and it was scary. But at the same time, this is Stockton, California, where crime is everywhere you know it was crime happening in my house it was crime happening in my community we lived on a corner where the hood literally was right around the block so i, I mean not the hood but the turf was where, where everybody hangs out was right around the block so it wasn't like i never saw crime but i never saw anybody murder like that well at one point as your mom got heavily into drugs you actually got put in foster care correct you were how old at the time um i was eight eight years old i've heard horror stories about the foster care system. Especially when I talk to someone that went through foster care, I'll ask them how many foster care homes they're in and you'd get some astronomical number, mm -hmm. 23, 34. Like how many actual foster homes were you? Well, I was in two foster homes. I was in the, the children's shelter three times and then I was in a, a, a group home and then I was in a boys ranch. So, I mean, I moved around a lot, but in the course of five years for people who've been through the system, it's not a lot, you know? Um, yeah. I was with one family, they were abusive to all the kids, just wasn't fitting for me. Um, the second home was really good. That's where I learned Christianity and going to church and my faith in God. And that family today, we're still close. Um, and then I ended up leaving there because I still wanted to get home. My mom, I would still run away. I still wanted to be with my family. Ended up in a, um, a group home, did that for about a year, and then, you know, just got tired with that, moved on to a ranch, and then that's where I graduated out of that, went back with my mom. I mean, was there any abuse going through the foster care system? I mean, the one home, the one home with the Chapmans, they were abusive. I mean, the father was really aggressive. Um, he wasn't beating us with like bats and stuff like that. I mean, he was just, um, you know, you're not supposed to whoop or beat on the kids that you're fostering. And um, I think that he really disregarded the law. He just felt like as a father, he was gonna, um, you know, discipline his children by whooping them. And I think he tended to do it more with the foster kids than he did his own children. So I just decided that wasn't a place where I would live. So I just left. Well, there was a situation in a gas station bathroom. Yeah. How old were you at the time? At the time I was seven. Seven. So that was before I went to foster care. So what happened? So there was a local carnival where um, my, the community used to have just carnival rides. So we would all go again, remember back in, so seven, seven years old, that was 1984. Um, I was, you know, a kid that just wore key around his neck and went around the community. I was everywhere um, and kind of doing my own thing. And I went to this carnival and this guy lured me into a bathroom and I was young. So I followed him in the bathroom um, and he exposed himself to me. And, you know, he didn't anally penetrate me or make me do any type of oral sex or anything like that. It was more of like groping him and fondling him. And it was but to me, that was still molest. I mean, that was, yeah, you course. sexually took advantage of me. Yeah. I think the most disappointing part of it all wasn't that, it was the fact that when I told my mother, she didn't believe me. You know, because I feel like when a child tells you they've been molested, you know, um, I, I don't know what the stats are, but most times the kid is telling the truth. Um, and so I was um, a little surprised that she didn't believe me and ended up forcing her to take me to the police. I think I talked about this in my book too. And, um, and they took the report, but I don't even know if anything ever happened. Okay, and that was your first sexual experience, I'm assuming. Correct. Okay, do you think that affected your sexuality later on in life? You know, I've heard people talk about, oh, if you're molested, it makes you gay or you're born gay. I don't 
believe that the molest made me gay because I don't conflate being molested with being gay. Being molested and sexual predacy is different yeah. than sexual identity. Um, at least that's what I believe. Um, and I would say that um, I think as I've just explored my sexual being over the years, I've had relationships with women, I've had relationships with men. Um, there was at one time a trans man tricked me. Um, but you know- Wait, You got tricked by a trans man? No, you don't wanna go there. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, that was some bullshit. But um, what I've learned over the years is that, that I didn't let that experience of being molested define me because I got molested twice. You know, I got molested by a babysitter's um, husband. And um, I never let any of those two experiences define how I look at myself, how I value myself, how I value others, how I engage other people, how I look at sexuality. And, um, and I've been very open about it because I know there's a lot of people who have been victimized and that have survived. I don't see myself as a victim. I see myself as a survivor. And, um, you know, I, my mother, I think she struggled with it in a very different way. It really consumed her life. Her whole life with her parents were, was um, embedded in the hate she had for her father and the, and the disdain she had for her mother not believing in her. But then she did the same to me when I brought my issue to her. She didn't believe in me. Hmm. So she allowed her trauma to get the best of her, whereas I turned it into power and I used it to share my story to help others. I mean, initially as a kid, I mean, I remember being in, in grade school and, you know, having my first kiss and, you know, being attracted to girls and everything else like that. Were you initially attracted to girls or guys or you just didn't know at that point? No, I, no. when I was a kid, um, I was attracted to girls because the boys were with the girls um, and I was I was a product of my environment. You know, the, I mean, you go to recess, you play with the, you, you go play with the girls. I mean, you know, the boys did the boys thing. But when you're flirting, you're flirting with the girls. Um, when I, you know, ironically, you know, I just was thinking of this as we we're talking. I talked about this on my last show, Hollywood Unlocked Uncensored, where I had a babysitter who was 16 and I was eight and we fucked around. Oh, really? But when I talked about it, I talked about it like I was an eight year old. I had this 16 year old girl and people in the comments were like, you were molested again. Well, because, yeah, you were. But I, but I didn't really think about it like that because again, when you look at the community that I come from, you know, and I know you're friends with Boosie and Boosie's, you know, I've been very critical of Boosie with his son. You know, that really was the world that we grew up in, you know? And so um, as I sit here and talk about it, I'm thinking, oh, well, damn, I was molested three times. This one was by a girl. Um, so yeah, early on I was into girls and that was my thing. And then just evolved, you know, over, li over my life, I just evolved into other experiences that led me to where I am today. Well, uh, by 1991, age 14, you left the foster care system. Yeah. And you had to move back in with your mom again. Yeah. And things didn't go too well. Well, I, when I, you know, when I was away from her, I really wanted to be with her and I loved her and didn't understand why a mother wouldn't do everything she should do to get her son back, um, to get her child back. And so when I got back after five years, I had a lot of animosity and I was really angry. And I intentionally took it out on her. I was very mean to her. I was very disrespectful to her. It was almost like there was a switch because when I came home, I felt like there should have been some reparations for me being away. You know, how do you make it up to me? How do you, how do you own that? And so she was never able to really get to that standard of love that I expected from my mother. Then on the other hand, that led me to go flee and find my father's side of the family. And I spent a lot more time with them, wanting to be around them, not necessarily be around him, but be around my grandmother, my aunts, uncles, all my cousins and stuff, because I have a huge family. My grandmother had 15 children. They all had multiple children and they had children. So when I came home, immediately had a lot of animosity towards my mom. Well, your mom would say things like, you ain't nothing but a fucking N word with yeah. a hard R. Yeah. You're just like your piece of shit father. Yeah. Regularly. She would tell me you're not going to be anything. She would tell me you're going to be nothing like him. Um, I remember when I talk about in my book, when my brother Rodney was murdered, I came home from being at the hospital, having seen his dead body, having watched him get murdered, having spent that night with him um, to then go home. And the first thing out of her mouth was, you know, when she was asked, she was going off about me coming in late. And I said, this is not the right time. And she goes, why? And I said, because Rodney just got murdered. And she said, they should have killed your black ass. That was literally how she chose to comfort me. So, yeah, I mean, 
there's a lot of explanations why I didn't really like her and why we had the relationship. All my friends around me didn't know all the details of my history. They didn't, until they read my book, they really didn't even know the foster care and the abuse and all that. So they didn't understand why I was mean to her. But I mean, that was the last thing I would think a comforting mother would say to their kid who just watched their brother mur get murdered and, you know, is clearly physically, emotionally, like, distraught. So. Well, uh, at one point, you started calling Michael Jackson studio? Yeah, man, Michael Jackson is the king of pop. I mean, Michael, it's Michael Jackson. Like, this, if, if it was today, it'd be calling Beyonce, but Michael Jackson, as for me, when I was in the group home, going through what I was going through, um, in my hometown, there was a school shooting where this guy named Patrick Purdy showed up to a school full of Asians. It was an Asian, predominantly Asian school. He blew up his car on the playground. All the kids ran out and he shot them with an AK-47 and then he shot and killed himself. It was ridiculously crazy. But again, this is at 10. Mind you, South Bay get murdered at seven. I've kind of been through different experiences. Um, so I was becoming more numb to it, but this was so shocking because we had never heard of a massive school shooting ever. And this was the first, I think one of the first that we had heard at Cleveland middle school. So, um, Michael Jackson, one day I was getting ready for school and they said, Michael Jackson's on his way to Stockton. He's coming to meet with the kids. He's coming to the community. And I, I thought that was huge. He was already huge to me as a young black kid who danced in Stacey Adams and had the little curly hair and, you know, was looking up to this guy like, damn, he's fly. Um, and so when he came to Stockton, I just really got a sense of compassion and humanity and community. And like, that was the, the biggest lesson of selflessness that I could ever imagine because he didn't have to come there. And what he did was he met with all the kids to say, hey, your life matters. You're still here. You got to keep going. He paid for all the medical bills. He paid for all the funerals. He met with the staff. He went to the hospital to meet with the families. Like that was something that I had never understood. So I fell in love with him then. And then I um, got one of his albums and I saw MJJ Productions. I thought like, hell, I want to talk to this guy, you know? And I, and ironically, I look back now at the hustle I'm in and even like the hustle you're in, you know, we don't believe anybody's unattainable. It's just a matter of time and opportunity and when it makes sense. And right. so at, at 10, you know, you know, Michael Jackson should have seemed very unattainable because he's the king of pop. But I just called 411. I got that number and I called from my aunt Flossie's house every day. And to this day, she still laughs at me because she's like, yo, you fucking made it. But like you were running up my phone bill calling these fucking stars. <laughs> but I was calling every day and I finally got his assistant and we built a relationship where I would come like, hey, Evie, what you doing for lunch? She's like, oh, I'm having a salad. OK, how's Michael doing? Oh, he's great. He's in London. Can you tell Michael I called? So I would leave these messages for Michael. One day I'm at the house. At this point, I think I'm like 15 or something. My friend Spencer, my friend Jody, they're sleeping on the floor. I'm in the bed. Phone rings. Answer the phone. And this lady with a British accent, she's like, hello, can I speak to Jason? I'm like, yeah, this is Jason, what's up? And she's like, I have a call for you. And I'm like, okay. And she's like, Jason, so-and-so, yes. So she puts me on hold. And I think she may have thought I was a younger kid, but I was just woke up, had a deeper voice on the phone. So then a guy gets on the phone and he's like, is this Jason? He verifies my information. I'm like, yeah, yeah, he is. we have a call, hold on. So he puts me on hold. And then the next person to get on the call is Michael. And I swear to God, I never told the story early on because I felt like, who's going to believe me? It's almost <laughs> like, it's like, you're not, not going to believe me. So I'm like, hello? And I jump up in the bed and I'm trying to kick my friends because I'm trying to wake them up. And there's no speaker phone. It's a cordless phone. There's no speaker phone. And my friends are looking at me and I'm like, Yo, Michael Jackson. I'm like, who is this? And he says, um, you call me. Every now, Michael talked like a nigga. For those of you that can appreciate what I'm saying, Michael did not, that little mousy oh my god hello no that was not michael jackson it's the tone was there but the way he talked was very like hey what's up i'm like what's up he's like you call me what's up and i'm like who is this and he's like you don't know who this is i know who it was but i wanted to hear him say michael jackson and he said this is michael jackson and um i don't know it was a good moment the one thing i will i'll never forget he said to me though he said um how, how old are you 15 when's your birthday august 16th he says, so you're Leo. I said, yeah. He goes, there's an aura around you. I can feel it. you're 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 special. There's an aura around you. And I said, well, okay, am I special enough to come to Never Neverland? And he said, well, one day, well, I don't know, we'll see. And I never talked to him again. I never went to Neverland. I never met him. I never even called Evie back. I mean, I called her to tell him he called, but after that, I kind of just didn't call anymore. And um, it was very special, but it really bothered me when he died, how many people persecuted him and 
you look at the era of Me Too now where everybody's catching a Me Too. Me Too, Me Too, Me Too. It's like Me Too again, Me Too, Men Too. Like everybody's a Me Too. When um, you look back at Michael and although he was, uh, I think, more friendly to people's children than he probably needed to be in that personal space uh, for self-protection, I didn't get the sense from him on the phone or the sense for what he did for our community that that was that monster they were trying to paint. So I was really bothered by that. But I mean, that guy um, was special for sure. Well, you're back in Stockton mm-hmm. and now you start hanging out more yeah. and you have brothers. Yes. Link, Chris, and Rod. You did your research. Yes. And they were kind of in a gang. Yeah. So now you kind of became part of this gang as well. See, I, people back home would say, oh, he was Southside Mob. That, that's what they would say. He, he was Southside Mob for sure. I was nev- never in a gang. I never got jumped into a gang. I never made a commitment of being in a gang. I was a part of my community. So my, my brother Link was from, Link Jr. was from Southside Mob. My brother Rodney was from Lewis Park Piru. My other brothers, Chris and Christopher, were not in gangs, but they were just a, the family. So we're all in the family. But my family predominantly was Southside Mob. So the whole family, Southside Mob, huge family. And then my aunt and my, my father used to own a liquor store on the east side and my aunt bought it from him. So we had Pat's Liquors on the east side. So then my cousins from the east side were there. So we were kind of spread throughout the community, except for north side. We weren't the north side Crips, we weren't, weren't affiliated with them. But my brothers were heavily in the streets. Rodney was, I think Link was more heavily into the dope game on the South Side and he had been shot a couple of times and he had been in the streets and been to prison a couple of times. Rodney was in the streets from the dope side, the gang bang inside. The, he had a lot of respect and a lot of revere in the streets. So I was affiliated with them, but everybody used to say, oh, he's from South Side, South Mob, because I used to hang on the South Side, but that was really just where my family was. And uh, I guess being affiliated with them, somehow I got affiliated with that. Right. Well, with that affiliation, um, you end up getting shot in a yes. drive-by. Yeah. Tell me about that. So um, I spent the night at my grandma's house. Um, so my grandmother, Maybell, she moved from um, Mississippi with 12 kids and eventually had 15 children. And so we had a large family. And so we would all congregate. That was like grandma's house. We just go to grandma's house. So I spent the night there. Early in the morning, um, I wanted to go to a, a concert in Sacramento. So I told my brother, hey, can you give me a ride home? So Link picked me up. He said, before I take you home, we're going to go to the car wash. I got to wash my car. I'm like, okay, cool. Let's go wash the car. So we go wash the car. Uh, he had a Caprice Classic, which I always wanted one. By the way, I don't want a Caprice Classic or a 5.0 now, but I did. Uh, he's washing the car. And, uh, you know, the music's really loud, really, really loud. So I get out to say, hey, like, you know, are we leaving? Like, what's taking so long? Because he's also talking to people. The people are hanging out at the car wash. And then we just heard this big bang. And the first bang that went off, um, I could see some of the wall kind of chipped off. My pants exploded. And then this person screamed literally almost at the same time, which was crazy because it was the first bang. Um, But all this kind of happened so fast. So what I got later was they shot, it ricocheted off the wall, hit me, went through my leg, hit the wall, ricocheted and hit another person through their hand. The second, so now we're trying to find out where this bang is coming from. And I didn't know that I had been shot. I just knew my pants exploded. So this woman ran up to me and she said, I thought somebody threw an M80 bomb on me because it was close to 4th of July, uh, a big firecracker. And so she said, I think you got shot. And I said, I didn't get shot. So she opened up my legs, I opened up my pants and pulled out my pant leg. And just the meat was hanging over. It was just this big hole, like it was about like that big. And it was just the meat was hanging over and the blood was sizzling and the gene had burned into the skin and meat. So it, so this big hole is there. And so now I start panicking. My brother runs to the car and grabs a gun and now he's running around to see who's doing it. But we don't see anybody. And we're on an open street where if there was somebody shooting right there, you would see it. The next thing we hear is bang, another bang. And now it's so loud that I can't hear anything. And then the window across the street at the grocery store, this huge window just shatters and just breaks. So now we know the bullet is coming from behind us. What we found out, and so the bullet went across the street. It went through this woman's back, out her chest, and then into the side of the cashier and killed him. What I found out was they were shooting with a rifle through a hole in the wall behind us. And we were looking towards the street for the shooting, and uh, that was crazy. Okay, so you go to the hospital. Yes. You get patched up. Yes. 
And then you go to the house of the guy who shot you. Yes. Not knowing he shot that's me. the guy who shot you. Correct. How did you find out so, after that? Like, so this was you? this was the Hollywood Unlock skill investigator early on, I guess. You know, I can laugh at it now. Um, my friend, his name was Dare. Dare was a brother to a guy named Randy who was a Northside Crip. I was cool with them and their whole family. We lived in the same apartment building together. We ended up moving, we ended up staying there, they ended up moving out. When I was on the phone with Dare, he was saying to me like, my brother Marcel and this other guy are all meeting, having a conversation about some shit. I don't know what's going on, but he was explaining to me like there was something going on with them. I didn't put two and two together until after I went to the house. And when I went to the house, Randy was like, what happened to you? I said, I got shot. He goes, where you get shot at? I got, I got shot at the car wash. And then he starts going off about, why did you do that? Why did you go to the car wash? You shouldn't have been there. Like, you should be hanging out on the streets like that, blah, blah, blah. Like, he seems like he's concerned. So I'm like, well, I was outside. It was with my brother, whatever. Fast forward, my brother tells me the reason why the shooting happened was because Randy, because my brother's friend had slapped Randy's friend's sister and they conspired to go back and shoot him. But since he was arrested for that, they wanted to kill my brother. Inadvertently shot me. So once I found out, I was like, okay, y'all all going to prison. And I went straight to the, I mean, right when they arrested him for it, because, you know, one person got murdered, two people got, three people got shot. Um, yeah, I mean, I went to court. And I was like, yo, like, can we hurry up and get this underway? Because I got lunch. He shot me. He was driving. This is what I heard. Because I had already put it all together from talking to the brother. And I think Randy's out of prison now. Marcel is not getting out of prison. I don't know if the other guy's out of prison. Um, but uh, yeah, that was crazy. So he basically told on himself to you. He didn't say I shot you. Um, in fact, I mean, I've had people, I had people confront him in prison about it. And he said, oh no, it wasn't me. You know, I was in the car, this and whatever. But you know, uh, Randy and I were cool at the time. We're not cool now, of course, because I got shot. Um, but yeah, I mean, he was concerned because I think he really did like me as a friend, but also, you know, he was with that gang shit and they had to go and do what they had to do. <clears throat> okay, so you go through that. You get kicked out of public school. Yeah. You get put in an alternative school. Yeah. You left that. Sure did. Get your GED. Got my good old GED. I don't even know where that thing is at right now, but I got that. I'm a proud GED holder because there, there's a lot of shame. People had a lot of shame back in the day. I don't know now, but in getting a GED, it was like, oh my God, you're not smart. You're so stupid. You have to get a GED. Like, I just didn't like being around people because I didn't like the whole who's more popular, who's the most popping. Like, I wanted to get the fuck out and go get money. Okay. So now you're out of school and you try to actually sell dope. I did. That didn't I, was a, I was a one-day dope dealer. <laughs> <laughs> I can relate. I tried I tried selling cocaine for one day also. Oh, I didn't even... I skipped cocaine. I went straight to rock cocaine. Oh, okay. And, and let me tell you something. I, was, I will go down in history as the worst dope dealer to ever live. <laughs> I promise you. <laughs> okay. And your brother Rodney, <laughs> he saw that and said, listen, you're going to college. Rodney gave me the option. And what I love about him is that, you know, he, I think, I believe he, he loved me for sure. Um, and, and thought highly of me and my capabilities, but he knew I wanted to be just like him. I wanted the lifestyle. I wanted my hair to be like his. I wanted, I didn't want all the girls he had. Cause that's when I started venturing off in the guys, but I wanted that lifestyle, you know? And he said to me, you're going to get it one of two ways. You're either going to get out in these streets and sell dope, or you're going to fucking go to school. And I was like, fuck, I'm like every other kid. I don't want to fucking go to school. Let me give me the dope. So he gave me an eight ball and he gave me a 32 and he put me in the worst area of the city. <laughs> I think at the time, I want to say I was wearing Tommy Hilfiger because I was still a bougie uh, shoplifter. What they call it? Not a scammer, but I scammed later. What was I? I was a booster. Uh, booster. I was a booster. <laughs> I was going to San Francisco, Macy's. I was boosting that Tommy Hilfiger. So I had my little Tommy on and I was in the worst part of town selling rock cocaine now here's the crazy part i took a piece of this is fucking embarrassing i took a piece of um pa paper bag and a pencil and i was actually keeping track of the <laughs> i was keeping track of the money that the crackheads owed me i was working on a system oh, you put, of, give me the money uh, crack no, like that was like, all right i'm gonna give you this but you you gotta pay me back they're like yeah i'm taking names i literally put a pencil and a paper bag <laughs> So, so 
at the time I was also asthmatic. So I get chased by the police. Me and my friend Spencer, we run like three or four big long blocks and we end up jumping in a dumpster. Now I'm in the dumpster in my Tommy Hill figure, asthmatic, running from the police. And that's when I realized I'm not made out for this shit. Cause I have the gun on me. I got the drope dope on me. I'm in a garbage can. I'm laying next to my friend Spencer, who by the way at the time, he had a jerry curl. Nothing wrong with jerry curls, but that in the stench of dirty food and dirt and, and trash, it just was a lot going on in this dumpster. So I get out the dumpster and I call my brother Rodney and I'm like, hey, I need you to come pick me up. And I'll never forget, he comes down, he picks me up, we get in the car and he's like, what's up? I'm like, well, I spent the whole night under the bridge. Um, he's like, where's the dope? I hand him the dope or what's left. And he's like, well, where's the money? And I hand him a wad of money. <laughs> And he's looking at it like, this don't add up. And I'm like, well, he, and then I pull out the brown paper bag of the I IOUs. <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, you're fucking going to school. Like, this is not for you, you know? And and we laughed about it. He was not happy, but he he laughed. We laughed about it. And he literally took me to college and got me enrolled. Okay. And <laughs> around that time, I, I guess you had a girlfriend originally. Yes. But she started to get attracted to guys. Yes. And um, your first real sexual experience with a guy, you were how old? 18. Okay. 18. We, uh, <laughs> we finessed our way onto the Ricky Lake show. Um, that's how it all went down. But the backstory is I was going through a bad relationship where I wasn't feeling loved. I went back to what I was experiencing as a kid, you know, not really getting the love that I wanted, not getting the affection that I needed, not getting it reciprocated. Um, and then I started hanging out with a homie of mine and we just clicked and we just bonded and we started experiencing like writing together and hanging out together and rapping, so, writing songs and rapping. And then, oh yeah, I was a rapper. That was after the bad drug dealer experience. I became a rapper and a poet. Don't, no Tupac there, but you know, then we started hanging out and we started shoplifting together and being a boosters and, you know, dressing and throwing parties. And so we just built this relationship that just got really close. Then I had kind of heard that he fucked around with guys and I started to develop curiosity. So I set up this whole masterful plan to go on the Ricky Lake show so I could get him away from Stockton because we were not going to do anything in the city limits because being gay in my city at the time was very taboo. It was like, you're not going to do that. And uh, we ended up going to New York and doing the show. And, and, and like when we got there, it just instantaneously was uh, like there were, the attraction was there. We started drinking and we had the experience. Um, and then when we came back, I think it became more of an emotional investment for me because I actually liked what I was experiencing with him. And he at the time had a baby mom that he was living with and I was living with my mom across the street. So it was um, a very interesting time. Well, at that point, did you realize that you were really into men or were you kind of still bisexual around that time? Um, I don't think that I was putting a label on it because I was so engulfed in the experience that I wasn't really struggling with, am I gay, am I straight, am I this, am I that? I wasn't struggling with, what I was struggling with was making sure to protect it from it getting out because I didn't want to lose it. And I felt like if my girl found out and his girl found out, then there's no way it, would, it can exist anymore. And um, so it was more about protecting the privacy of it to keep, to maintain it. And um, and so, yeah, I mean, I didn't struggle with, I still was with my girl and he was still with his, his girl, but then there came a point where I wanted to leave my girl and just be with him, but he didn't want to leave. You know, he was like, there's no way possible. My mother's homophobic. My, there's no way our community is extremely homophobic. We had no plan. There was no, we're going to go get married. Like we didn't even know that men couldn't even get married back then. We, you know, hmm. think about that. Um, and so, yeah, we, uh, we held it as private as we could for as long as we could. Well, then 1997 rolls around. You're having a going away party. Your brother Rodney was there. Correct. What happens next? So not just Rodney was there. Uh, Rodney was there. My brother Chris was there. My brother Christopher. I have a brother named Chris and Christopher. That's what happens when you have a dad with different baby moms. So Chris and Christopher was there. Rodney was there. Link was in prison at the time. And my cousins were there. And so we were, uh, we had a going away party because I was, had met Queen Latifah at 15 when I got out and I was inspired to get to LA and figure this thing out. And uh, this was my attempt to really just get out of Stockton. You know, escapism for us was TV and music, but now I was really gonna escape 
the streets that I had almost died in to go and try to find this better life at 19. Um, and uh, so I had a going away party and Rodney came. You know, one thing I would say about Rodney was um, he was somebody that I could depend on for anything, anything and everything, any conversation. Even with my mom, I could call him and say, my mom said I was a nigger and that I, I ain't going to be shit. Like dad and this, and he would say, I don't give a fuck what she said, that's your mom. You know, and I would be frustrated with him because that's not what I felt. That's not, I didn't understand that. So he was always reinforcing person on what's proper and be a good person. Um, and so it was important that he be there because I was leaving, but I was gonna always come back. But anyway, so he's standing by the bar and we're talking and I'm like, hey, so, um, you know, we're kind of shooting the shit. And Rodney didn't really have good eyesight. And he was 6'5 and 235 pounds. So he was a big guy. And he was and he had this presence in the community where, you know, he would pull his gun out on you first and shoot you. Um, people knew that. Um, and he had been to prison several times. And, you know, he was a, a big uh, guy in the dope game out there. So um, he would always, he couldn't look, he couldn't really see. So it always looked like he was mean bugging people. I'm like, yo, why are you looking at everybody crazy at my going away party? He's like, bro, you know, I'm I'm blind. So we're kind of laughing. And then I, I we get a drink. I get a drink. And he gets a Sprite and he's acting like he's drinking, but it's a Shirley Temple. So it's this big ass gangbanger with a Shirley Temple. We're laughing and I'm just talking shit to him. And I said to him, you know, I'm about to get out of here and I love you. And I hugged him and I had never said I love you to him, which I never thought about at the time, but it's just, that's what came out. And then I, I just turned around to leave and I walked probably 10 feet. And then I could see my friend Phila from the South side trying to pull his girl out the club. And this girl, her name was Samantha. And Samantha lived in apartment 63 in my building. I lived in apartment 70. I could literally walk out my front door and see her front door. This is how small our city is. And um, as he's pulling her out, I'm kind of looking and then Rodney's standing off to the back and he's looking at it, um, unfazed of course. And then uh, Philip picks her up. And when he picks her up, I could see her, the gun come up. She had a gun in her hand. And uh, then she just pulled the trigger and it was like the loudest sound because it was a room a little bit bigger than this. So the the sound was really, really loud. It was a 45. So when she shot the gun, um, of course, it, it threw her back on Philip, And then the people that were in front of me kind of fell back. And so we're all on the ground. People are spilling their drinks on me and it's just chaotic. And then And then people start to get up and then we all run out. And so when we run outside... I'm standing in the middle of the bowling alley waiting on him to come out because it's really one way out. The other door has a chain on it, so you can't go out. You can only go out this way. So I'm waiting, um, and he doesn't come out. So I'm thinking maybe he's just in there chilling. I don't know. You know, I don't really hear anything. Just people are running. And then I hear more gunshots outside because she's shooting at another woman outside. And now people are running back inside. Now the people running inside got guns. The people outside are shooting. So I decide I'm getting the fuck out of here. I run down the side of the bowling alley lane, kick open the side door, go in the back, uh, open the exit, the emergency exit, climb over a fence and there's barbed wire on the top. So I'm like trying to figure out how to get over this barbed wire fence. So I get up to the top of the barbed wire fence and this these ladies are pulling up. I don't even remember who these girls are, but they're like, hey, aren't you? Aren't you Rodney's little brother? And I'm like, yeah, yeah. So I'm climbing down the fence and she's like, oh, I just think he got hit. And I go, what do you mean? She goes, it doesn't look good. I think he got shot. So I instantly just run back inside. And when I come back inside um, and and I'm starting to go back in the bowling out the bar inside the bowling alley, I could see there's just people screaming. It's chaos. And uh, our friend Tonto is on the ground giving CPR to who I now know is my brother. And, and then um, when I get up on him, you know, he's laying there in a pool of blood. And my two brothers are standing there. And it was the first time I think when you see movies where people have out of, out of body experiences, where you feel like your soul has just left your body and you're kind of looking at everything. I had that experience. And my brothers, one of my brothers, Chris, who was who had the same mother and father as him, was very numb, like he didn't believe it was happening. He just was standing there in disbelief. My other brother, Christopher, he was younger than me. I was 19, he was probably 17 or 17 or 16. He was just crying and, you know, going through it. Um, and I was numb. I was in disbelief uh, because there was no way the figure that I had built up in my head and that the community had built up had just got killed by a woman on some random fluke shit, right? So uh, Calvin was there with me, who was my boyfriend at the time. Um, and then we went to the hospital. And that's when things started really kicking in that this was real. And 
although I had seen the guy when I was seven get his throat cut and I'd been shot at 15 and been all through all that, that was the moment I think that, and I had other friends dying too, but that was like the first real, I think, death experience that I had that was real. Right. And like you said earlier, you came home, yeah. and you told your mother what happened, and she said, they should have killed your black ass. Yeah. You said you tried to avenge your brother's death? So my brother Christopher, so once my brother died, um, you know, we, there's, the, there's the death, and then there's the going in the back to see his body to confirm that he's actually dead because I was very angry. Um, I was angry because, one, um, I couldn't let my boyfriend comfort me because nobody knows we're together. Mm -hmm. Then I wasn't in a relationship with my girl at the time. My father was, my whole family had come to, not my whole family, but most of my family had come to the hospital at that point. And everybody was crying and whatever. But I just could not let anybody touch me because I was still trying to really process all the feelings. There was pain, there was rage. And I won't lie, if I, if I, I would be lying if I didn't say that there were a lot of people I wanted to die. Right then, there was the list, because my brother had told me a couple of weeks before, all these people that were trying them, this person doing this, this person's meddling in this and that or whatever. And and I said to myself, like, yo, like I, I was processing all these thoughts of what, what we should do. So my brother Chris comes to me and he says, hey, like these guys try to rob him or they robbed him, uh, you know, um, a week before. I'm like, well, who? And he tells me these guys are on Rosemary Lane and so forth. And so I call up my friends. And my friends, to this day, I ain't gonna say their names. One was in the military, another person was just a regular guy, and then my brother-in-law. Uh, and I call them up and I, and I say, hey, well, I need you guys to come to my house. We better go do something. So they, you know, my friends were, whatever you wanna do, they ride for me. So when they got there, I tell them what we're gonna do. We're gonna go to this house. We're gonna kill everybody in this apartment. And so we all got the guns. We all handed the guns out and uh, the hoodies and the mask or whatever. And, and I remember this is the stupidest thing. Like this is how people get caught doing stupid shit because they don't think about it. We literally put on masks and hoodies it was in the evening, but in a building where it was like extremely lit in the hallway, we just walked up with these guns and knocked on the door and pointed the guns. And in my mind, you know, on my brother's life, I just remember thinking like, whoever opens the door, it could be a kid, it could be a mother, it could be a grandmother, it could be a whoever, whoever opens this door, we're just gonna shoot everybody in there. Because at that point, I didn't really feel like there was any purpose of living at that point. I had lost the most important person to me. Uh, this person believed in me. so. Yeah, I mean, we we felt like we're going to go in there, we're just going to kill everybody. I thank God. That's why when I wrote the book, God Must Have Forgotten About Me, when I talk about it in the book, it was a fitting title for all the experiences. But when I look back, God did. God was there that day because my whole life would have changed if that if they would have opened that door. Thank God nobody opened the door. <sighs> okay. Well, the shooter got 22 years in prison. Yes. That was the female? She's a female, yeah. Okay. Were you a uh, part of the trial? I was a part of the trial. Okay. Yeah. When you heard about the 22 years, was it any level of closure? No. No. Because um, I wanted her dead too, you know? Um, I'm I'm not a person that says, well, just got to forgive thy enemies. That's good for the Bible. That's not how I felt. Yeah. You know, um, when you have somebody who's had so much loss and despair and dysfunction in their life, mothers on drugs, mothers out, fathers not there, molested, shot, this, that. at some point you like, damn, like, can I get a break? So for me it was, okay, you know, and there were different people trying to get at her in prison and do things to her. And I wasn't a part of that. I know a lot of trauma happened to the her boyfriend whose gun it was that she used. Like they had beat him, almost killed him a couple of times, stomped his eye out of socket. I remember calling him, calling me, and then begging me to have the community stop. And I remember calling some of the shot callers, like, hey, can y'all just like ease off of this dude? Because I don't know that he had anything to do with it. And they were like, nah, this ain't got nothing to do with you, you know? And they weren't giving him any passes and they were trying to kill him. So um, when she got 22 years, I felt like it was a disservice because I know a lot of men, black men who get more prison in life for three strikes at the time for drug offenses are stealing pizza and shit. And this person stole a whole life. My brother had just had his first child who was six or seven weeks old. Um, and he was very proud to be a father. He was changing his life. Um, yeah, so no, 22 years wasn't enough. 
Well, I mean, you had your going away party in 1997, but you didn't actually move to LA until 2006. Yeah, I so mean, that kind of I guess derailed your plans. It derailed everything. It yeah. it brought back a bunch of insecurities because in many ways I can move through my community without any fear of anything because nobody wanted to do anything because Rodney was there. Like I knew that, so that brought back immediate insecurities in my city. Um, people didn't feel like they could get at me, but they still. I felt like at any point I would have to handle myself because there, that's all I had left. Then, then uh, I I just didn't have the wherewithal at the time to really gather my thoughts on being focused because I was so distracted. I was depressed. I heav- started heavily drinking. And so I just stayed home to figure out a way of building stability back home um, to give me like some time to figure it out. And honestly, like this hustle, I didn't understand you know, eating what you kill. I needed to have a job because we were, we grew up knowing that you got to find you a good job that pays you every two weeks. And, um, and so yeah, there was a lot of fear there and just going out and figuring out about myself. Okay. So then by 2006, you actually do move to Los Angeles. Yeah. Uh, you start out as a youth counselor, uh, in the probation department in back home. Oh, okay. Oh, so my trajectory of jobs, I got a job working at my high school Mm -hmm. that I took the GED from. Uh, did that for two years. They, you know, they started really, you know, and, and when I look at my career now in media and I look at all the job experiences I've had, I've been grateful to have had careers like working in education where I learned, you know, um, the world of education. And what, what really came out of that was my fighting for the workers that the union was trying to get rid of. And so I took the school on, I took the union on and I ended up losing my job, but then I ended up becoming uh, a probation officer and working in my community because I wanted to help at-risk kids, kids who've been victimized, kids who've been, um, you know, victims of their community and circumstances. Did that for three years, but I found most of my career was trying to change the system mm-hmm. because I I realized quickly that the judicial system and 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 places where they incarcerate people is a business, and that um, you know, of course, years now I found out it's the trajectory of slave and slavery and all that, but. Um, you know, mass incarceration, the problems there. I didn't really get it then because my interests and efforts were to try to help these kids, but it, I was always fighting with the system. So I ended up fighting with the system, getting fired from there. Uh, and it was funny because the chief of the chief of probation said to me, um, I'm going to get rid of you now, I'll pay for it later. And I ended up suing them, I ended up settling, and I ended up getting hired by the union who saw me fighting them. And I did that career for 11 years, and that's what brought me to LA. Okay, so you're in LA. And you work, I guess, through, uh, you're working at Kaiser Permanente? Yes, so I'm the union The whole union lead thing, with everything. Kaiser, yes. But then by 2009, you decide to leave that whole career path. Correct. And jump into entertainment. Yeah, I didn't just choose to do it to jump into entertainment. I was forced out, but it was my cho- choice to live. And choice to leave. And there's going to be a connection between my choice to leave a current situation with this. Because over my life, I have built fundamental principles that I live by. Um, in my relationships, I don't lie, I don't cheat, I don't steal. There's just three things that just I don't do and I don't allow somebody that I'm a partner with to do. Um, in my personal life, you know, you have to stand and believe in stuff. I believe in certain principles and fighting for the underdog has always been my thing in, in education, in probation, in the union. So when I got here, our parent union took control of the local union because we were fighting against some of their ways of um, taking control away from the workers. So they took us all to a hotel and they gave us one day to decide, do you keep your career? But if you keep your career, you have to lie to the workers. You have to go out and say this, or you have to quit today. That was the choice that I was given. And mind you, this is what, I'm 25 years old. I'm living in Hollywood, Burbank. I got a Mercedes. I'm getting $10,000 a month. I'm rich. You know, uh, very successful having come from a GED, drug addicted mother, foster home. I made it, you know, to all standards, I made it. But now I'm faced with this choice. Do you stay and lie to the workers and keep this cush job or do you leave? I left with no plan. I literally had nothing. So I left. Um, at the time, though, I had been moonlighting at night with different celebrities and built relationships with people. So I'd be like, okay. You want to book so and so? Let me call him and see if you do it. Ten percent, thirty thousand off of thirty three hundred thousand. So I started just finessing and hustling. So I started kind of consulting or whatever, and that was kind of my thing when I left. Right, because I guess you met uh, Alex Avant, who is the son of uh, Clarence Avant. Yeah, 
legendary guy. Yes. And uh, he kind of saw some of the potential and started to work He did, but, way. you know, I always laugh with Alex because as much as he's a visionary, and I love you, Alex, as much as his family are visionaries, and he is a, a power player, he, he, he helped me to see that I needed to become the brand so I could own and control and build it, but he didn't want to manage me. And I was like, yo, I'm offended, but I think it's because, you know, my tact when I got in the game was very much... Yeah, I said whatever I wanted to say, and it, no, everybody was a f you know fair play, and so I think for him it was a little too reckless. But he never wanted to manage me, and I remember him saying like, "Yo, you know, this agency they ain't gonna sign you because you're just too messy." And I'd be like, "Yo, I'm I'm a reflection of the community, you know. I'm out here doing the Lord's work. How dare you?" <laughs> um, but yeah, he did. He was the first one to take me to dinner and say like, "How do you become the brand?" and force me to see myself. Right, and uh, rest in peace to his mother, I guess. Uh, who got killed in a home invasion. Yeah, it was horrible. Yeah. It was horrible. And, um, you know, Alex, if you know him and you know the family, they are a very close family. I know he, his mother and father are very well respected. Um, that was, I think, the well, after Pop Smoke, of course, that was like really like a big indication that Hollywood in L.A. has just lost its fucking mind. You know what I mean? Like this woman was, um, I think, in her late 80s or early 90s. I mean, I mean, very well respected in a nice home, in a nice community, great background, friends with the Obamas. I mean, everything about them is pristine and they're just a great um, reflection for our culture. So t for her to get killed like that so randomly was just, it was crazy. But I called and checked on him and he's working through it. And I saw him recently and he seems to be doing okay. Good to hear, man. That was, that was a messed up story. Yeah. Well, uh, your mom, I guess, gave birth to another son when you were 17. Yeah. And to avoid him getting into the system, you ended up adopting him. Yes. So you became a father at age 25. Yes. And nobody's ever bought me one Father's Day gift, you know? But yeah, I did. I took him into my home. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I know and understand mental health now more. I'll be honest with you. I was stressed out this morning, anxiety, Googling what medicine do I take for anxiety, texting my doctor, I need some for anxiety. And this has been like, this is kind of therapeutic because I'm actually talking through a lot of shit. <laughs> um, but, you know, I didn't really understand like my mom's psychological stuff, right? And how she had a crack baby and his psychological stuff and the chemical and de you know, dependency issues or whatever. And I didn't understand all that. I just understand, be good, don't steal shit, don't break shit, eat your food, go to school, do your homework, clean your room. Like that's just all I knew because I wasn't parented. I didn't have a parent really, you know, beyond seven or eight years old parenting me. Um, and so bringing him in my house was extremely chaotic. I had a relationship that was very toxic. I had him who was very out of control I put him in the best private school. Um, I bought him whatever he wanted. I took him to trips everywhere around the country. But I was I, I was realizing I was giving him love by giving him stuff, not necessarily giving him love because I didn't know how to give it. Yeah. And uh, he's he just was out of control. Uh, right. Because at one point he threw a Molotov cocktail on the freeway and set the freeway on fire. So I'm driving home from work and uh, I'm just listening to my music and I look on the freeway and I see... And I mean, I see it in the distance. I see this large cloud of smoke, but it's generally in the area where I live. And something over said, he did it. <laughs> <laughs> like, so I call the house and I said, so my boyfriend at the time, Josh, he answered him. I said, Josh, where's Paul? He goes, he's sitting right here. I said, has Paul been outside? And he goes, no. I said, can you look out the window and tell me if there's uh, smoke? And he looks at me and goes, oh my God, the whole freeway is on fire. And I'm like, so Paul's not been outside. And he goes, no, listen to him ask you, has he been outside at all within the last 30 minutes? For five minutes, he goes, well, he walked the dog. Well, that's when the fuck he did it. Mm. So uh, I get Paul on the phone, I go, Paul, did you burn the freeway? No, 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 are you always blaming me for things? No, no, Paul, you, I know you did it. As I'm getting closer now, the freeway's blocked off. Can't get off the off ramp. There's helicopters pouring water on the palm trees. The whole freeway is on fire. The side of the <laughs> apartment's on fire. Wow. I'm livid because I'm stuck in this car talking to them, knowing that he has something to do with it. He says he didn't, but whatever. So I get there. The, the fire chief comes to the apartment. The neighbor saw him throw the cocktail over the fence and light the whole uh, thing on fire. Right. That was the end of your fatherhood at that point. That day. Yeah. That was that it. day. Oh, that, that was, was it. it. But it, but it wasn't even still my choice. He he heard me call the social worker and say he's going away. Like he's out. They, you know, they ended up arresting him. Uh he 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 got out, came back home, 
No, back up. He didn't get arrested. What he did was he went in his room, he jumped out the window, ran to the park, family's having a picnic, takes their keys, walks to the parking lot, finds their car from the alarm, steals their car, can't drive, drives off, crashes the car, gets locked up, and I told the people, keep him. Mm. I'm done. Okay. Well, then in 2012, your mom passes away. Yes. How was that? Was there sadness? Was there... The relationship was never great to begin with. You know, now I don't have to deal with this person anymore. I mean, I know I know people in your situation have had these types of mothers. Yeah. And it's always a very strange feeling when that person passed yeah. away. Recently, this woman wrote a book called I'm Happy That My Mother Is Dead. And I was like, oh, my God, I can't believe she said that. Because that I don't even want to open the book because I don't even want to know that she's sick enough to be happy that her mom's dead. But I also understand title, the jarring of creating a title, you know, whatever. God must have forgot about me, whatever. It makes people want to read it. Um, when she was, when they, my cousin, Anitra, was the, she's the director of nursing in the hospital my mother was in. She called me and she said, hey, you may want to come and check on your mom because she's in the ICU and uh, it doesn't look good. I had just been with her the week before, visiting her in the nursing home. And for the first time in my whole life, I, bought, I left and I bought her some flowers and I, had them because we had a conversation and I was always trying to find a way of giving her closure because I knew she wasn't doing well and I wanted her to be at peace. And she was always in turmoil over what I thought about her parenting and what I felt about her. And, you know, was I mad at her or did I blame her for stuff? And so I, I visited her and I said, oh, no, she said, I did the best that I can. I just I did the best I can. She was crying. So, OK, so I left. I stopped at this flowers place i bought her some flowers i had them delivered with a card that said i forgive you and i understand you did the best that you can so a week later i go then i go back to la a week later i get a call from my cousin anitra or maybe like four or five days later and she says hey your mom ended up in the hospital and she's in the icu you should probably come and see her because it doesn't look good so i'm like well can you go look at her chart and like run it down to me because i was next to ken tell me like what what does it say so she went and read her chart and she called and she was like yeah you should you should probably come home so i go home. My mom and my sister are fighting at the time. And then my brother is not living with me. He's in the community. And, uh, and uh, he's 18. And so we go to the, ho the hospital and I walk in the hospital with her. And I said uh, to her, you know, she was in a coma uh, before I got there. She came, awoke when, when we got there. And my sister came in and, um, you know, she was just crying and crying and just apologetic. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. You know, just trying to make up for lost time. At this point, I had closure. Like, I had released it all. I got it all out of my system. It was emotional because she's passing and still your mother. So I was, you know, I was emotional and my sister was crying. And my brother, of course, was having a really hard time because he had never experienced death. By this time, I had seen my brother die. I had been seeing my friends die. I had been to so many funerals. I had been shot. And so I was a little numb to it, but you know, I was more emotional because they were emotional, but I was the big brother, so I had to kind of hold it together. And my mother said to me, you know, it's just really important to me that I know you forgive me. I said, I forgive you. I, and I genuinely forgave her. And I, cause I, it hit me that she said she did the best that she could. So I had to have some compassion for drug addiction that was out of her control, molesting mental health that was out of her control. So I had to put my experience aside uh, not to invalidate it, but to just say, okay, that happened to me. But for her, I have to release her by forgiving her because that inherently is going to release me. So I said, I forgive you. And so she got that. And then I said, you know, you and my sister, you guys need to talk because they had fallen out. And so I left them in the room by themselves and they had an emotional moment. Then I came back in and she said, um, you know, just make sure you take care of your brother. And that, that was hard because he took it the worst and she was afraid for him. And we knew that she was afraid for him because he didn't have the skill building to be able to survive, you know, and now he's 18. So um, we said our goodbyes, whatever. And then she literally died the next day. Yeah. So I'm sorry for your loss, but there's a lot more to that statement, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. Well, your first blog that you started was called lowkeymessy.com. Yeah. I thought about the shade room before the shade room. I thought, right. low key messy. We ain't gonna be too messy. We're just gonna be a little messy. And celebrities, they love mess. So 
they're going to participate in it. I know all these celebrities, so fuck it. LowkeyMessy.com. Right. Uh, that Brilliant got, idea at the time. Brilliant. Right. That got rebranded to IamJasonLee.com. Immediately, because people were like, I ain't fucking with him. And people were, I, I was surprised at how people were reacting because it's me doing it. I thought, okay, he's going to be a little messy, but he's not going to be like, you know, what media takeout at the time was where they were making up stories or they thought Fred and them were making up stories. So the immediate reaction was, we're not fucking with that. So I said, okay. I met with Alex Avon and he said, Jason, like, how do you become the brand so that way people know what they're investing in? Because low-key messy, you can be low-key messy, but are, is that you? And I go, well, sometimes it can be, but he goes, no, just, just be Jason Lee. Just be Jason Lee. So I rebranded everything. I'm Jason Lee.com. And I just wrote about parties I went to, things I saw, what I thought. Uh, what, what I didn't think, what I thought was hot and not. And there started to be some traction, but I'll be honest with you. It wasn't, of course, where I am now because I wasn't fully obsessed with it. I, I had the idea and I had the passion, but I was also in a relationship again. And um, I wasn't investing the obsessive amount of time that it takes to really build a brand. Now, 2015, was that around when you met Floyd Mayweather? No, t- when I meet Floyd, uh, wait, yeah, about 2015, yeah. Do my research. Yeah. Okay. And you guys start to form a friendship. Yes. What was the basis of that friendship? Because, you know, Floyd is Floyd. He's constantly having people flock around him and want to be part of the money team and everything else like that. But the two of you seem to have kind of a, an interesting kind of special relationship. Yeah. Um, when I saw Floyd, I saw Rodney, honestly. It was huh. it was really interesting. Um, not immediately, but when I started to spend time with him, what I saw was what you saw. A lot of people want to be around him. You know, he's the money team. He's billionaire. He's the best boxer. He's this, that, whatever. I was not even watching boxing like that. I didn't know Floyd Mayweather's movement. I didn't know Pretty Boy Floyd. I knew he talked a lot of shit. And I and I saw the one fight where the guy uh, kissed him or something and the bell rang. He just punched him. Ortiz, I think. He just punched him right when the bell, uh, whatever. And I thought like, yo, that that's some dope shit. Like, you should protect yourself all the time. You being cocky, you got your ass whooped. So that's, I remember seeing that. So my friend Kichi becomes his assistant. She's like, yo, Floyd's going through a breakup with Miss Jackson. And like, I, you're a good person and you know how the internet works. I want to bring you around so you can talk to him. So I go and I meet Floyd and um, we're at his, I'm, I'm there in Vegas. I'm supposed to go to the fight. They don't call me. So I'm like, fuck it, I'm going home because nobody called me. I'm just sitting in my hotel. And I was about to leave and she says, come to his mom's house. We're watching the fight right now. I go, okay. So I go to the house and Flo Rida is there, Cat Williams and all these people are there. And everybody is just, I mean, obsessively around this guy. And I'm like, man, like, he's like their God, you know? And I'm just kind of chilling with the mom and I'm drinking and eating or whatever. And uh, so she brings me up to him and she goes, hey, Floyd, this is uh, Jason Lee. Jason's Floyd. He's like, hey, how you doing, man? Nice to meet you. Um, Bring him to the big boy mansion. So I go back to the big boy mansion and um, he walks up to me and says, so tell me about you. I said, well, I'm a blogger and I'm gay. And the whole house just went silent as fuck. Like the whole house, because you know, very macho, very testosterone. Everybody like, what the hell? And uh, I see, I'm Jason, I'm a blogger and I'm gay. And he goes, well, why would you say that? Like, I I don't, I mean, why would you say that? I said, because if you fuck with me, like that's if you want to get to know me or if I'm gonna get to know you, you just gotta know who I am. Like I'm, and I think the reason why I was coming at him like that is I was so frustrated with people not taking my work seriously and not trusting me and the people that I had invested years of building relationships with were just not really fucking with me. And I was over it. I was over the industry. I was over all this. I was exhausted. And he said, well, I don't really have any gay male friends, uh, but that that doesn't bother me. And I said, well, I've been here for a couple hours. You got a gay friend. And he grabbed me and we were outside laughing hysterically. And he's like, who him? And we're just talking and joking. And he was like, yo, this dude is funny. And then we said, and I said, okay, you want to be a blogger? And at the time, I thought I wanted to be a blogger. You want to be a blogger? Ask me a question. I said, okay. I said, um, everybody say you're the best ever. Why you keep running from Pacquiao? I mean, that was literally my question. And he was like, and and everybody around me was like, who the fuck is this guy, right? Because that's all I knew. People were saying he was running for Pacquiao. And his answer to me was so brilliant. He said, when I got in the game and went to the Olympics and lost, I was robbed. And I never wanted to feel that feeling again. And when I got into professional boxing 
and everybody told me that this was the guy to beat me, I knew he was going to be the last one I fought. I was going to build a whole career out of people hating me because that was going to fuel my passion and desire to be the best ever. And one day I went on the Ustream as Pretty Boy Floyd and they were like, oh my God, the money team's on. I was like, well, I guess we're the money team. So when he started talking to me, I was listening to him from a business perspective, like how you branded yourself. How did you become an independent, wealthy black person? And how do you live on your own terms? He talked about how, you know, Pacquiao, He has a lot of respect for him, but he respects him to leave him last. So that way, everybody in the world will want to see the showdown. I mean, his his marketing genius from the onset of his career showed me that I wasn't even looking at how my exit was going to be. I was just looking at just writing a story. I was literally in the business for writing a story instead of looking at the business of it. So then... I, we start talking more and, and then as I just kept asking more questions, he pulled out a check and he laid it in front of me and it had so many numbers on it that I had never seen a check. It was four, four comma, zero, 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 comma, zero, 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 some point zero, zero. It was like $44 million check or something crazy. And I remember looking at that and he said to me, if you work hard enough, one day you're going to cash one of these because You have this thing about you that's special, but you got to really be obsessed with what you do and lock in. And that was when I decided I'm going to be around this motherfucker. And I'm going to just because the feeling I feel now, I'm on fire. I literally felt like I could have gotten a ring and beat Pacquiao's ass in that conversation. (laughs) So I grew an immediate respect for him. But I also knew that in order to be his friend, he had to know that I was really gay and he needed to accept my boyfriend. He needed to accept my lifestyle. I wasn't going to change for him. So the next week I found out he was going to be in D.C. doing some charity stuff for some kids. So I flew out there with my boyfriend, got a hotel at the hotel he was staying at. And when he got out the car, he's like, well, what are you doing here? I'm like, Shit, I came to see you. Like, I came to support the foundation. He's like, OK. He said, I say, yeah. he said, who's this? I go, oh, it's my nigga. And he goes, hey, what's up, man? I go, no, no, that's my nigga. Like, this is what I sleep with. And he was like, he, he, he was puzzled. He like, what? And I'm like, yeah. So he folds his arms. He looks confused. I said, you got questions? He was like, hell yeah. So we go up to the room and him and all his friends are there and we're all laughing, the girls. And he goes, he's looking and he's pacing the room. I'm I'm like, if you have questions, ask, because if I'm going to be in your world, I'm going to bring him in your world. And he goes, okay, so you're his boyfriend. And my boyfriend goes, yeah. And he goes, and you're gay. And my boyfriend goes, no. And he goes, the fuck out of (laughs) here. So he's going back and forth. I'm like, no, he, he likes girls. I only like guys. He's my boyfriend. Right now he's in a gay relationship, but he's not gay. And Floyd's like, fuck all that. He's gay. He's cracking his jokes. And after it all, we had this long conversation. Everybody in the room is laughing. I'm laughing. And he says, man, I fuck with this dude, man. Get him some TMT clothes. Get get that rainbow shirt. I said, what the fuck? I don't wear rainbow. What the fuck you think I walk around pride like a bag of Skittles every day? And we laugh. And we just had a great time that whole week. He made sure that my boyfriend was respected. He made sure his team, you know, made sure that we were front and center as part of his group. Um, we were on the bus with him. And and then afterwards, he was like, yo, man, you want to come to Vegas and hang out? I'm like, yeah, put me on the jet, went to Vegas. And, and, and I started looking at him like my brother. And he became a mentor and a friend. And even to this day, um, when we get off the phone or he'll call or whatever, and we talk almost every single day, he'll say, you need anything? You good? You need, you need me for anything? If you need me, I'm here. And I don't need anything. I don't, I, you know, I don't ask for anything. I, I don't need them. But, uh, but he, he really reinstilled the faith and belief that I could actually do what I want to do. And so that's when I said, fuck it. This is not Jason Lee anymore. It's Hollywood Unlocked. Because Hollywood Unlocked was my tagline. I am Jason Lee, Hollywood Unlocked. I said, fuck that. I'm Jason Lee and it's just Hollywood Unlocked. So I started really looking at the business and I started to look at what you were doing and looking what the shade room was doing and looking what ball alerts doing and no, oh, oh, these and researching pop sugar and saying, oh, they had an exit for hundred million, 200 million. So I started thinking like, I could really do this. And I didn't do it with the speed and pace that I wanted to, but I did it at a pace where it allowed me to learn a lot and get to a place now where I get the fundamentals of the business and scaling and P and L's and budgets and all that. Like I get it now. And, and, and now I'm in a good place where now I'm becoming the teacher. Yeah, and there's something about you, you know, and this is this is going to sound really ignorant, and so I'm sorry to everyone when I say this, but like, you know, you being a gay man, you and I have always had a cool friendship yeah. and a cool energy with each other, which I've not been able to do with other gay men that I've met mm-hmm. over the years. I'm sure you've heard mm-hmm. stuff like this. There's usually, at some point in the relationship, something kind of goes wrong and I get yelled at, <laughs> you know, like, or or it, it turns into kind of like this bitchy kind of personality and, yeah. and there's sort of like, nah, I'm not really cool. This makes me feel a little uncomfortable. But there's something about you where, although you are gay, it's not really a factor in a relationship that you develop 
with straight men. Yeah, Wack always says, Wack 100, Leo, Wack 100, I don't care what they say about Wack. I don't care what antics. He's the one that introduced me to Kanye formally. He mm -hmm. always is in my corner, you know? And when I first started being friends with Wack, he said, yo, man, this nigga really gay? But I fuck with this nigga. Like, he get, I wish everybody else, all these other gay rappers, would just be gay like you. I'm like, yo, bro, I ain't touching that. I don't want no problem with the gay rappers. <laughs> I'm cool over here with my gay shit, you know? I would start to walk in rooms and, and walk, be like, yo, this is my gay homie. I'm like, no, I'm not going to be your gay homie. That's what I'm not going to be. And I think the thing that was important for me is that being gay is my sexuality, which is my private business. Yeah. Who I am as a person, I'm just a nigga from Stockton that didn't have shit who's fighting for everything he ever dreamed of. And I don't, I, I respect that, like, even in today with the evolution of our community, that, you know, Dave Chappelle should be able to be great and say what the fuck he wants, like Eddie Murphy did. Or you should be able to interview somebody and ask hard or horrible questions that aren't necessarily horrible. They just may not line up with what you believe, but there are questions that somebody else out there may believe. Mm -hmm. I don't, I feel like this cancel culture is fucked up art. And so when I meet people, I don't want them to be uncomfortable with me being gay. And I don't want to project who I am on them. I get it straight guys if I like them, because to me, a man is a man. And if you tell me you ain't interested in me, okay, cool, whatever, next. But I don't, I don't want to make anybody feel uncomfortable because I don't want you to make me feel uncomfortable. Now I will say, I'm at a point in my life where I say, I'm not gonna let nobody make me feel uncomfortable. Now, if you try me personally, intentionally, then I'm gonna fuck with you because we all got stuff, but uh, I don't I don't lead with my sexuality. And that's why when I did Love and Hip Hop, I told Mona, you can ask me anything you want, I'll be anything you want on the show, but I'm not gonna be gay. I'm not gonna talk about my love life and who I'm, because mainstream wants black gay men to be sassy with purses, makeup, and then a fucking accessory to a woman on a reality show. I ain't that shit, I'm a fucking boss. And there's no way I went through what I went through in the streets of Stockton and watched my brother die, who believed in me to be great, to then become this figurine of what people think a gay man looks like. Caricature. A caricature. Yeah, which you, which you have never been. Yeah, no, no, yeah. I, and I won't be. Yeah, and, and I respect that. But don't get it twisted, I go to I was at Poppy last night with Cardi B. I might go to the gay club today for a drink. I may pop over to, I ain't been over there to Bethlehem or to Jerusalem or wherever, to Tel Aviv, where they say it's gay over there. I'm gonna get, get to Tel Aviv. I just came from Greece, it was gay as hell. But I love people. I just love people. I love all races. I love just people. I just love being around diversity. And, and I love the fact that you acknowledge that because it's important to me because I know when I walk in a room and interact with people, they see me as a man, a businessman, they see me as a gay man too. And it changes the optics for what we look like as a community, because there's still that messy shit. And I look at some of the messy shit too, and I tell some of my friends, I ain't with that shit. And 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 they they get mad at me because they feel like I've been able to operate under the veil of being straight, but I'm not acting, I'm just being myself. You know what I mean? Well, did Floyd fund Hollywood Unlock? No, so Floyd sponsored the podcast. He got behind the podcast early on and became a very big supporter of that. I took that money and just bankrolled my business <laughs> because it was like, I got the money. I make sure that I can keep the lights on. Um, and, and at the early stages of the business, I really didn't understand like how you monetize a YouTube channel, how you monetize the website. So it was keep your URL going, keep your web hosting, make sure your social media is going, pay you know the, the people that you have, the, the small scalable skeleton crew of staff but uh, yeah, no, he was very supportive in that way. No, no. And then in 2016, you guys did your first interview. I don't remember the year, but I remember yep. that interview. Six hours. Yep. And then in uh, 2017, you, Floyd, and Soldier Boy <laughs> did an interview together. Iconic. <laughs> Interesting yeah. combination there. It, it was, um, yeah, Floyd calls and says, do you want to interview Soldier Boy? I'm like, sure. He was like, do you want to interview both of us? I'm like, sure. At that point, I was just trying to do interviews. Like, I didn't know what Soldier Boy was going to say or what Floyd was going to say, but I knew that Soldier Boy and Chris Brown were in this huge fight. Me and Chris were friends at the time. Um, and so when I get down there and we set it all up, uh, the interview went down and it was, it was wild. Okay. And that next year, 2018, that's when you and I met because I had seen the noise you were making and I had reached out and said, yo, you know, if you ever want to pick my brain or if you ever want to work together or whatever you know we formed this little we had this little dinner thing with other media outlets like i said in the beginning yeah. and that's when you and i kind of formed our business relationship and our yeah. friendship which still carries on yeah. uh to this day and you're the only person that checks me in a nice way let me tell you how vlad checks me vlad texts me and goes he sends a link to his content that we post now i never post my team does and he'll say 
can you take this down because you guys didn't credit me or they didn't credit me? And, you know, I really appreciate that because I look at you as somebody who schools me too. You know, like I'm not perfect in the game. And other people, you know, they'll send me all kinds of craziness and I'll just be like, whatever, I'm, I'm getting sued by so many people. Um, not anymore, all my losses are gone. But, um, but, you know, I've learned from you too and I appreciate that from that dinner. Yeah, I mean, when people use my content, I have certain rules yeah. when people use my content. I don't necessarily have a problem with it, but I don't want people to cut out a logo, stick their own logo on there, because at the end of the day, a lot, you know, 15 years and millions of dollars have been put into that logo. And but it'd just be like boosting clothes again. I boosted your content. <laughs> you know, like, I'm not a booster anymore. And, I, you know, and we have policies on how we respect and protect people's yep. IP. So a Absolutely. Uh, I guess at one point, you were supposed to have an interview with Escape. And when T.I. found out about the interview with his wife, Tiny, being an escape, now there's the whole story Man. between T.I. See, I'm learning. And Vlad, did his, Vlad did his research. Yes, we were supposed to interview Escape. Um, you know, I know Candy directly. I, know, I didn't know Tiny directly at the time. I mean, I know who she is now. We know each other. Um, I know Tamika now. I don't know her sister. But uh, yeah, I was supposed to interview Escape. It was scheduled. Uh, we all got to the studio. We were all ready to go. Escape came. And then they escaped. They <laughs> that, literally escaped. That was because of your affiliation with Floyd. Correct. And Floyd and T.I. had had the fight in Vegas where- yeah, a fist fight. Fist fight where T.I. allegedly had two black eyes and put makeup on to cover them up. I don't know. That's what Tiny told us. Um, and then, you know, they they ev evaded the interview. And so I went on and talked about that. Well, that same year you interviewed Khalees. Yes. And that was the first time she really talked about the whole Nas relationship and, and everything else like that. That yeah. was, a, I felt, an epic interview. I almost missed that interview. That was my first real interview. I, I mean, I've had interviews. I mean, Floyd was a real interview and other things that went viral. But that was when I felt something in the interview because she had shared that she had been abused by Nas. Um, and she had alleged that they had an abusive relationship. And she made the connection to being in her home bruised and beaten like Rihanna. And when she said that, because it was so, I didn't even expect that to come out of her mouth. I felt the magnitude of what it was going to be because I don't believe she had ever talked about their relationship like that. Yeah. I mean, I'd interviewed uh, Nas's uh, baby mother mm. uh, and she told the whole story. But the Khalees part was always sort of an unknown mm -hmm. because you knew that they broke up right when she was pregnant but you didn't really know where it went because Nas is very private and she was very private but you actually managed to you know pull out a lot of information in the interview yeah and I mean you know I'm a huge Nas fan you yeah, know I me mean not Nas is an icon you know and so you know I I never have had the privilege of interviewing him and I try to avoid him because I know that it stuck with him you know I yeah. saw when his rollout came after that Billboard was like what okay we get the album but what about that like you gonna talk about that and so I know that that followed him for a while and I've been around him in rooms and in shows and concerts and stuff where I just don't go around. Not that I'm afraid of him at all. It's just I, I'm very uncomfortable because I do have a revere for him. But at the same time, I've got a job to do. And it was her interview to say what she needed to say. And I'm going to do another interview with her soon. And we just honored her at our award show, the Hollywood Impact Hollywood Unlock Impact Award. So, yeah, but I, I remember when she, she called me that day, I was uh, actually on my way to Vegas. Floyd had sent his plane to pick us all up, me, Melissa, and everybody. And... Uh, I say, hey, Khalees, I can't. I got to go to Vegas. I'm gonna. Hear. She was. If you don't come and do this interview, I'm gonna give it to TMZ. And I said, okay. And she, I'm frustrated with my baby dad. And I said, okay, well, I'll come. So we went to her backyard, set up the cameras, and she sat down and we talked. And it was and and it, and it allowed me to really develop my interview style too, because my interview style is I want to disarm them and make them feel very connected, like you did me, <laughs> and then and then ask them questions to get them in a place of comfort, and then ask them the hard questions and. Uh, I didn't see that hard question coming, but I could read her body language and tell that there was more there. And when I asked her if he hit her and she said, yeah, I used to beat it. I was like, well, it was wow. Well, that next year, 2019, you guys actually broke the story about uh, Tristan Thompson messing around with Jordan Woods. Correct. At that time, he was in a relationship with Khloe Kardashian and Jordan Woods was the best friend of Khloe's sister. Kylie. <laughs> Kylie Jenner. Yes. So you got this information. Yes. And listen, as someone in the media, I get a lot of information. Mm -hmm. I get a lot of things that fall in my lap that I say, okay, noted, I'm going to leave it alone. Yeah. Sometimes I'll even take that information and call the person and say, hey, this just crossed my desk. I'm not going to put it out. 
but I'm letting you know that it's floating around out there. And actually, I've actually been able to form relationships, strong relationships, relationships with people over doing that. Yeah. But there's always the balancing act. Yeah. I got this. Do I put it out? Do I not put it out? Yeah. You decided to put it out. Yes. Tell me the rationale behind it and your thought process. So, 2010, I became friends with, uh, or 2009, 2008, maybe even. I became friends with Rob Kardashian, mm -hmm. and we were friends. And I had a lot of love for Rob, and I wanted to help Rob be great because he was tired of doing the show with his family. He didn't feel like they respected him. He didn't feel like it was beneficial to him. And he was a wild boy out in these streets. Me, him, Chris Brown, uh, different people were hanging out at the time. Jordan Woods was in, in the mix. And um, so I helped him develop the Rob Kardashian Jr. Foundation. And we were gonna, I called City of Hope and Children's Hospital. Mind you, I used to work with Kaiser. So I had the connections in healthcare and I thought we would create a foundation that would service those in need for cancer research, cancer education and resources. I create a whole deck, whole event, and the performer at the time was Kanye West. You can't even write this. It almost looks like, I mean, I still have the deck where Kanye would perform. And uh, we would do this. And Chris, we'd spend all this time on it, and Chris decided not to do it. So I had developed a relationship with Chris Jenner. And uh, then that didn't work, so then I go and do a party with Kelly Price and Faith Evans, and I invite Whitney Houston, and then Whitney Houston dies. And then the world goes crazy, and I don't know what to do, so I call Kris Jenner. She helps me through that. So I think I develop a relationship with these people in my mind. Cardi B becomes a star. They want Cardi B to come and hang out with the Kardashians because they really want to keep up with Cardi. So I bring Cardi to Chris's house, so we're social. Kanye's there, Kim's there, Chris is there, Corey Gamble, me and Cardi, and we're having cocktails and eating guacamole. So I'm thinking we're socially cool. We're not friends, but we're socially cool. Enough to where I can pick up the phone. I got Chris's number. I didn't have Chloe's number at the time. I had Rob's number, whatever. But me and Larsa Pippen had developed a really close fr friendship at the time. And they were still close. So I'm getting ready to get in the shower, and my my editor calls, and she says, hey, what are you doing? And we're just kind of shooting the show. I'm like, oh, I'm about to get in the shower. I got to do this, got to do that. She goes, okay, cool. I'm going to go do this. I'm going to do that. Oh, I went to this party last night. It's so crazy. Jordan and Tristan Thompson are messing around. I'm like, what? <laughs> She's like, Jordan Woods and was all over Tristan Thompson. And I'm like, are you sure? She breaks down the whole, they took our phones. There was hookah. I got this video. She didn't have video of them canoodling or whatever that what they were doing. But she had videos like in the house. So she was there. So, so exactly what happened, walk me through exactly what happened. So she walked me through what happened. And she said that, the, you know, they were all over each other and that they were taking everybody's phones and like, you know, Tristan. Now, mind you, she had sent me videos of Tristan out with other girls before. I just never, I passed on it because I was like, you know, I don't know that situation. I don't know what their relationship is. And I don't have, I wasn't close enough to Lars at the time. So I let that one go. This one, I was like, you know, I got to at least give Lars a heads up because I feel, and Chloe, because I feel like this is shady and I don't want to know this if I do decide to break it, and Lars is my friend and I don't tell her because then it's gonna be awkward that they know we're friends. Cause me and I had been to Lars's house with Courtney and you know they 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 knew we were familiar. So I call Lars and I say, Hey, um, you know, this uh I just got this information that Tristan and Jordan were messing around. And she was like, No way. This is crazy. I'm like, no way, for real. So she calls uh uh Kim. And Kim is like dismissive, like, absolutely not. This is crazy. Like, there's, there's no way. So she calls Courtney and she tells Courtney, Jason Lee just told me this. And if Jason Lee said it, you know, he wouldn't lie about something like this. So Courtney called Chloe. And I guess on their phone call, uh, Courtney told Chloe, if Jason's saying it, there has to be something there. And long short of it all is my understanding and talking to Chloe, she then called and confronted Jordan. And Jordan told her that something had happened. Now, I guess Jordan had called her earlier that morning and said, hey, I stayed over last night. I stayed there later to make sure all the girls got out. Everything was cool. But she didn't tell her this other part. So I guess when Chloe confronted her, Chloe said she admitted it. So I, and, and, and Chloe said, run it, run it. I said, okay. So I ran the story. And then TMZ tried to take it and say it was their story. And so I called Larson like, fuck that, we're not doing it. And I called, and at the time I got Chloe's number. And I said, I'm not doing this. I'm not going to politic with TMZ. Clearly, that was my exclusive. Nobody knew but me. Like, if you guys told him, she was like, no, I'll go on there and comment. So she went on and commented, verified it. Then all hell broke loose. Yeah, all hell broke loose. Uh, Jordan Woods essentially got kicked out of that whole family structure. Uh, but the thing is, is that if you look at Jordan Woods, it's almost like the best thing that's ever happened to her. 
Like she now has a basketball player boyfriend. She's doing Fashion Nova ads. You well, know, let me let me jump in. Not only was this all happening at the time, I was also friends with Jordan's mom, Elizabeth. Mm. Knew Elizabeth very well and have a lot of respect for Elizabeth. In many ways, Elizabeth was raising her kids the same way Chris was raising her kids to be stars or whatever. Hmm. But she was the sidekick. The minute this happened, it thrusted Jordan outside of that shadow and she became her own woman. She lost weight. She started really getting into fashion. She started becoming a voice in the black community because black people really stood behind her. She leveraged her relationships with Will and Jada to go and get that look on Red Table to stand and got and Will and Jada ended their relationship with the Kardashians defending her. Huh. Chris okay. and and Jada had a fight on the phone. I mean, like, this is what I was told from people around them, that there was this huge fight. Jada was like, y'all not going to do that. And so Jada and Will rode for Jordan. And and what I saw was Jordan grow into a beautiful woman on her own. She doesn't just have a basketball player, a husband, a boyfriend. I really like Carl Towns. I mean, I really like how he respects her, honors her, treats her. I've seen them out at dinner. Very awkward running into them at Craig's or at <laughs> fucking uh, Crustaceans because it's like, I want to go over and apologize because I'm not sorry I did my job, but I'm sorry that it was as painful for her. I understand that like, the sister had to be relocated from school because she was getting threats. And there was a lot of fallout from that. But in many ways, I've joked to and said they owe me 10 percent. <laughs> right. Because she's done movies. She's doing brand deals. She's her own woman now. And mm -hmm. she seems very genuinely happy. And it's all about Jordan. It's not about Kylie or being her best friend anymore. No, like I said, I think it's the best business move <laughs> that she could have possibly made by messing around <laughs> with Tristan. I mean. At the time, I'm sure it was hell, but you fast forward a couple of years and it's like, you're right. She's got all these things going for it. When before, I had no idea who she was. I was not watching Keeping Up with the Kardashians, but now everyone knows who Jordan Woods is. And like I said, Fashion Nova is giving her a check. She's got movies and all types of other stuff. And she's now her own woman because the joke was at the time that, oh, Jordan Woods isn't saying anything because uh, Kylie turned off her phone. <laughs> right, <laughs> or, this, or, or that she was living in Kylie's backyard. Right, exactly. You know, but now you're living in your own world. Yes. You built, you built your own world. You right. took, you know, for the Kardashians, their empire was built off of a sex tape. Mm -hmm. For you, your empire is going to be built off of this scandal. And so, you know, run with the lemons that you were served and build your own lemonade stand the way that they did. And I feel like, you know, I've talked to Elizabeth since then, her mom, and I told her I want to interview Jordan. I want to sit down with Jordan. We don't have to get into all the details of that. I really want to talk about the woman she is now and what she's mm -hmm. come through because, you know, uh, I don't want it to be awkward when I see her. I don't write these stories uh, with malice and I'm doing this to get this person. And some people have felt that way, but I don't write that way or, or I don't even write, but my team doesn't write that way. We're not sitting there plotting to destroy Jordan Woods. We're just telling stories. And in there, there's some fallout from some of those stories. Well, speaking of stories, you had written some stories about Karen Civil. Yeah. And she had asked you to remove the posts you did not. Correct. And after everything came out, she had actually hired a hacker. Yes. To take down your Instagram. Yes. And she actually. And our YouTube and everything. And our YouTube they, and they everything. They only got the Instagram. And you actually talked to the actual hacker who did it. Correct. He admitted to it. Yeah. And when you confronted Karen. She admitted it. She admitted it. Yes. And that was all private. And you know. When I was on my rise, I still felt like I was being attacked by all these different bloggers. I was being doubted by these celebrities. I wasn't getting the support. So I was always on defense mode. Like I was was defending myself and I always felt under attack. And this felt like a big attack. And she was very confident in telling me to my face she did it. Like it was like, yeah, I did it. You know, like you left me no choice. Like, and I remember feeling like, bitch, I'm gonna get you. I'm going to fucking get you. You know, everything with me when it comes to how I move is strategic. You know, you know, we sit on stuff for a long time mm -hmm. and 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 it's just not the right time until it's the right time. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I knew that that happened. And the, the, the biggest lesson of patience was how to eat that for three years, to eat it, to just focus on building, rebuilding, focus on my business, focus on keeping moving forward, knowing that I was sitting on this. I knew one day it would come out. And I told her when I saw her, I don't know when and where and how, but I'm going to get you because there's no way you can do that and and think it's okay. And, and now when I look back on it, it wasn't just 
that she took my Instagram. It was that you were trying to s stop the voice of the culture for me. You you were hurting my employees that I have to pay for. You were you were putting a black eye on the dream that I had as a young kid wanted to leave me his hometown and make it and and you were flexing because I was holding you accountable like we hold everybody accountable and I felt like I had to do it and 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 I have to say this when I went on the breakfast club to talk about her going to prison and me wanting her to go to prison I really would have wanted to see her go to prison because she deserves to go to prison when I came back we called the FBI we called attorneys and statute of limitations and all that I felt like I can either put all my time into destroying a person, which isn't gonna do anything for me because the damage is done, the culture knows who she is now. Or I can go back and develop courses to teach people like me, the lessons I learned, teach new people who wanna come up the game. And so then I develop courses to help people do that. Yeah, I mean, I've known Karen for a while. I think she had booked our the Nipsey interview, the one I did like 10 years ago or something like that. But my relationship with her has always been kind of weird. And I remember this one time, there was this fake story that was floating around that, um, you know, A. R. Ab had gotten convicted uh, for some serious crimes and got all these years. And there was like this fake publication that said, oh, the judge personally thanks DJ Vlad for helping to convict A. R. Ab. It was a fake story from a- from Oh, and a, that's when they started saying you were the feds. Well, they've been saying that, but, but that kind of put a lot of, I started a trend and everything else like that. And certain blogs were posting up the story. And the, the story was just fake. It was a fake story. Did she write the story? No, she did not write the story. But she posted it on her blog. Okay. So I, you know, I have her phone number. I say, you know, Karen, can you please remove the story? It's fake. Took her a while to remove it, but she finally removed it. Cool. No problem. We went on with our lives and so forth. Then when the Nipsey thing started coming out and there was all this backlash that she allegedly did this or that or whatever. You know, everyone was posting the story. We had posted the story as well. I get an email from her lawyer with like a cease and desist and, you know, threats of a, you know, of a uh, lawsuit and so forth. And then she hits me and she was like, yo, I need this removed. And my thing was like, Karen, when you post up a fake story about me, I personally hit you and politely ask you to take it down. I didn't get lawyers involved or whatever. She's like, I didn't get lawyers involved. And I'm like, here's the email from your lawyer. <laughs> and then she started like gaslighting, talk about some other shit and whatever. I'm like, well, whatever, Karen, we'll, we'll take it down. I don't give a shit. It just shows the difference of respect that you yeah, have with people. Yeah, she doesn't have any. She expects yeah. you to do what she wants when she wants. She expects because she's now general general manager for Lil Wayne and his company or this person, Mac, Mac Miller, or this person with Nipsey, like she builds these relationships and then tries to use the weight of who they are to give her the power on how you treat, you engage with her. And I always felt like I'll go, I want my own relationship with Nipsey. I want my own relationship with Wayne. Like I, I revere Wayne as one of the best rappers ever lived. So why do I have to not have a relationship with him because you're there, you know? I, I And when she first, when, remember when, um, what's the rapper's name that wears all the pink? That I, that I, I camera. Camera. Yeah. He don't wear pink all the time, but you know what I mean. He yeah, had the pink sure. look. Okay. When she did it to Cameron and he called her out. Yeah. Cameron accused her of stealing a bunch of money. We took it down when she called me because she was like, Jay, and I, I took it down and I said, okay, well, come on my show. Because I thought we call on my show. We're going to talk about it anyway. Mm -hmm. She then scheduled to call my show and she said, I'll come, but we're not talking about Cameron. Well, then why are you coming on my show? It's called Uncensored. <laughs> yeah. So I canceled the interview. Then when the next one came around, I was like, I'm putting it up. And that's when she sent me the season to say, call me all that. Did the same thing with me. And I said, no, Karen, is staying up. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's one of those things. Listen, uh, I don't know her that well. After that Nipsey interview, I spoke to her about scheduling some other stuff. Nothing ever happened. And it rubbed me the wrong way, the way that the interaction was. Because like I said, I personally hit her. I didn't get, I have lawyers just like everyone else has lawyers. But I'm like, yo, if I know you, I'm just going to hit you. Right. But you turn around and send lawyers at me and it's like, yo, this is lame. Right. This is, this is just lame. But listen, people going to do how they're going to do. They're going to make their money. How they're going to make money. How they're, how they're going to make their money. And unfortunately, someone like a Karen Civil does not have a, you know, owns assets and can monetize and so forth. She's always chasing after the next check. Yeah. And whoever's going to pay her and so forth. And that puts you in a different mentality, in a different hustle mentality. So sometimes you have to move differently when you're in that type of space because- Hey, listen, if no one books you, those checks ain't coming.
You know, and the, the, the Jordan Lucas thing, you kind of see how she'll grab checks and so forth. And, you know, maybe she'll perform, maybe she won't. But I think that once you get that check, being in that type of position, you're, you're just thinking about the next check and not always about fulfilling what it is that this person paid, paid you for because you know that you're not going to get residuals right. off that payment. Right. Um, I mean, she'll call it code switching, you know? <laughs> um, and, and speaking of the courses, we teach code switching in there, but we teach it from a perspective of being able to adapt in different environments, not adapt to get money and run, you know? And I think, you know, she's, she's, she's in a very craftful way said, well, I worked with these people and it just didn't work out or they weren't hot enough or nobody was interested. Well, then don't take their check if you know nobody's interested or take their check and use that for marketing. Buy ads on Vlad, buy ads with Hollywood Unlocked. Don't just pocket and go get a Bentley and end up in a video with Nicki Minaj all of a sudden, what are, what's happening? Like, who are you? And 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 like I said on The Breakfast Club, you know, she she worked with Hillary Clinton. She lost, Hil Hillary lost, Karen lost. The culture knows who she is now. Whoever decides to work with her, I'm not gonna say cancel her. That's your choice. At least I did my job and I put out my story, you know? And and I've, I also think it's important to say, like, I've also grown to a place in my life now being 45 where I've released that anger with Karen. Like, she did what she did to me, but I have to follow suit with every other experience in my life where somebody's victimized me. It's like, you did it, I learned from it, I grew from it, and I'm better from it, so good luck. Well, uh, 2022. You guys were in the media for announcing that Queen Elizabeth Listen, had died. She died. I don't know if she died then or if she died five <laughs> months later, but the woman died. Yes. <laughs> but she announced that she died. And actually, I think the House of Lords or something even responded and said that there is <laughs> no credible proof to this. Or, or No, something no, that that's not what happened. So, uh, OK, we can laugh now. This was not a laughable experience. <laughs> I'm um, sure. I don't know if you have you ever gotten a story wrong. Yes. OK. This is a story of stories, right? The, the queen, the, the leader of the monarch is dead, right? Yes. And we didn't even say she was dead. We said she was found dead, which means we say she was somebody actually found a dead body. Let me tell you how this went down. So I'm in Miami driving down the street and I get a phone call from somebody and they say, and you know, you get calls from sources and mm -hmm. the sources sometimes be celebrities. Sometimes it's staff. It's It could be anybody, wait, waiters. I get a call from a credible source that says, oh my God, like some shit just went down. I'm like, well, what happened? I'm riding down the highway in Miami. Queen Elizabeth just died. When I look back at it now, I go, okay, that was probably, that's just crazy, right? Um, what was even crazier was that then I called my editor and I said, I got this exclusive. Now the person that called me, I believed it. So we ran it. And and I share the story and I talk about it now because I think it's a story of redemption and like experience and learning and taking an L and turning it into a lesson and, and surviving, whatever. But uh, it was very painful. So we went through it. We posted that the queen was found dead. And when I tell you that I've never seen the world blow up the way that it did from that one story. So many lessons were learned. How powerful my platform was, how big my reach was. Well, that's no surprise, though. You're you're announcing that the Queen well, of England, the, the longest running monarch in the history of England, has well, died. Well, well, it 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 was surprising to me because still, in many ways, I didn't understand how the power of my platform. I mean, I still I knew that we had reached. We had I knew that, but well, I I think and let me let me just interject yeah. real quick. I don't think it, it much that, you know, it's not really the power of your platform. It's the fact that when you have a legitimate established platform, regardless of powerful or whatever in the grand scheme of things, if you're established and you've been doing it for a while, when you put out something like this, people are going to look at it seriously. Right. So what I'm saying is the, the, the legitimacy gives you power, right? right? So once you have reached a certain level of legitimacy, you have a power and a responsibility. Right. And I learned a lot in that experience. So we put this story out. The world blows up. Now, I'm on vacation, so I said, okay, call the the um, palace and confirm if this woman is dead or not. You know, this was before we even put it out. And the answer was, we can't confirm or deny. Now, you can confirm that she's alive, <laughs> but if you say you can't confirm or you can't deny, and the source was a really strong source, she did. So I said... Put it out. And so my editor was like, are you sure? I'm like, yeah, put it out. Put it out. So she puts out Queen Elizabeth found dead. 
And when I tell you the phone, I mean, just I had to turn my phone off because one phone literally turned off because it was blowing up from Japan to China. I don't even know how these people got my number. And then then I started getting all these calls. My friend was riding in the car with me, my friend from Vegas. Um, I think maybe you were even there. He's looking at me like, is everything okay? I'm like, no, this vacation is going to be weird. <laughs> <laughs> vacation is going to be weird right now. You know, he's like, is everything all right? I'm like, no. So then, um, so then they start attacking me. So I call the source back. I go, are you 1000% sure? They double down. So I double down. Like I'm, I've never been wrong. I'm right. So then they write a new, now it's Jason Lee doubles down and now it's like bigger than that. And I'm like so frustrated. So I'm getting all these calls for interviews and finally this one lady, she sends me a nice email from BuzzFeed. I'm like, oh, she's such a nice person on email. I'm gonna just call her up. So I call her up. I'm like, look, so we have a conversation. She then goes and writes this crazy story. Then the next morning, a fake tweet says from Hollywood Unlocked, a fake account says, mm -hmm. our intern did it. We got it wrong. We fired her. I, I said, so Variety runs the story that I admitted that it was wrong. So I tripled down. <laughs> right. I'm never account. tripling. If I see the dead body laying in front of me, I'm never tripling down again. Triple down is like crazy. So once I tripled down, that's when, you know, Roland Martin, his fat ass started talking shit. And I was like, you know, dick ass nigga. And you ain't even seen your dick. And people under 90 don't even fucking know who you are. Fuck out of here, nigga. Like, we don't give a fuck about you. Get your fucking big head ass out of here. So, you know, people started attacking me. Then it was like, okay. Then it was like all guns blazing. Fuck it. We going down in flames, you know? <laughs> but I had, I had done an interview with the LA Times and shout out to Keenan and, and he hadn't finalized it yet. And he was like, I have a couple more questions given the last couple of days. I'm like, look, bro, I'm going to give you the questions, but I need you to just make sure, like, be fair. And he told me I will be fair. He had come to the yay brunch with me and uh, he wrote the article in LA Times. And I felt like it, it, it helped to stop it. So was she really dead during that time? According to Twitter, um, you know, Look, I don't want to joke because people get really offended when you talk about the queen. Mm -hmm. They don't get offended when you talk about how she stole them diamonds from Africa. They don't get offended when they talk about Meghan Markle and how black the baby was. They don't talk about Princess Diana burning up in that car. But, you know, whatever. She's an idea to them. So I'll let them have that idea. Um, I found it funny how black Twitter ate my ass up over this racist white woman. Uh, and then when she died publicly when the white people say she died, they always say, Jason Lee knew all along. We knew he was telling the truth. He's never been wrong. I'm like, yo, I'm done with y'all. Like first I was right, then I was wrong, then I'm right again. Uh, what I will say is that, uh, I don't know if she was dead for five months and they did a weekend at Bernie's with her or if she died five months later. I'm you sorry. You say weekend at Bernie's. I'm sorry. That, no, because. <laughs> Jason, come on. You man. grew up in an era we saw that movie. <laughs> yes. I I'm not saying that happen. happened to the queen. I'm saying that it's sad that somebody's grandmother died and it's sad that the leader of that world died and it's sad that her the new queen consort or whatever she is was the side chick to the new king when he was fucking around on her with Diana. But whatever. Like, you know, they they got their issues. Um, I was just surprised at how the culture came after me for getting it wrong, as if we all don't get things wrong. And I and I and it flipped itself upside down on its head when she died publicly, and they go, "She been dead." Jason knew the whole time. I was trending. I told Cardi, "I'm not even going live today." I did. I, I went on my Twitter. I said, "I have nothing to say today. Like I'm leaving alone." I mean, Black Twitter and Irish Twitter were celebrating on Twitter <laughs> <laughs> that day. So in some way, I unified. You unified two worlds. Two worlds. Yeah. Well, uh, you did an interview with Kanye. Yes. And then after that, it was announced that you were the head of media and partnerships. Correct. You did a, a Black Future Brunch for Black media outlets. Yep. I understand why I wasn't invited. Well, Vlad, I mean, <laughs> we know that you, we know that you push hip hop, but you know it was a very specific thing. And I, I know I'm joking. Yes, I'm messing with you. So here you are. You're working with Kanye. Yes. And things are going well, supposedly. And then the fashion show happens. Well, there's a lot that built up to that because, you know, we, we started working together in January and the fashion show just happened. Um, just a little bit more context. I launched Hollywood Unlocked Studios, a space where I create and I can allow other creators to come and create. Mm -hmm. WAC 100 calls me and says, when's your studio open? Because I have somebody that needs to use it. I said, it just opened today. I was in the kitchen talking with Blue Toulousma about how I was going to market this thing. And he goes, let me put you on the phone with the person. He puts me on the phone with, yeah. And I'm like, oh, shit, I've been trying to get to you because I want to interview you. I want a relationship with you. He's like, oh, well, tell me about the space because he was going to develop a podcast for his cousin. 
I said, well, let me know. Anytime you want to use it, you want to come check it out? Cool. So he says, well, when can you meet? I said, well, when do you want to meet? He says, tonight, an hour. Can you come to Craig's? I'm like, sure. So I go to Craig's. Uh, and I have dinner with him, Wack, uh, for four hours. And Julia Fox is there and everybody's there. And, and Ye has me sit right next to him. And he's asking me questions all night. Listen to this song. Do you like this song? What do you think about this song? What do you think about that? What's your views on this? And he's just asking me all these questions. And I'm just answering them as honest as I can. And um, then after four hours, we leave. And uh, Evan Ross comes at that point, And then we leave. And then uh, the next day, I'm in the studio. And Floyd and Evan show, stop by to see the space. And then Kanye calls and says, do you want to go to dinner? I'm like, yeah. I'm like, who are you with? He's like, I'm with Julia Madonna. I'm like, Madonna, like the icon? And he's like, yeah. I'm like, okay, well, I'm with Floyd and Evan. Let's all go to Delilah. So we go to Delilah, we have dinner, and AB pulls up with ASAP, and everybody's there, whatever. And uh, then we have a great night, we listen to music, everybody's, they're all kind of talking and whatever. And then he leaves and gets in a fight with the paparazzi. So the next morning, he calls and he says, hey, man, I just want to apologize in advance. I didn't really understand the platform that you have and and the voice that you are for the culture. And I need somebody to talk to. I'm like, okay, what happened? I mean, I had saw the news, you know, whatever. I mean, what happened? So he starts telling me. And so what do you think I should do? I said, well, if it's not me, whoever you trust, I think you should do an interview because every time you get in some shit, you go to Wyoming. Like, we don't understand why you keep running to Wyoming. Like, what just, like, you're Kanye West. So he says, okay, where are you? Text me the address. So I text him the address to the studio and he says, I'll call you back. I, I go in the kitchen, I have in a meeting with this lady and her daughter, an artist, and my team is there kind of just working around and the doorbell rings and open and it's Kanye. And I'm like, what's up? He by himself, he comes in and he reads to me this, this uh, press release that his publicist wrote for him in response to what happened. And I said, no, you're Kanye West. Just stand in your truth, go and talk to whoever, and be Kanye, the black man, the father, the just be human, just like talk, just be honest. And, share your point of view so he said well can we do that are you equipped to do an interview right now i said absolutely i hadn't prepared i didn't have questions or nothing so yes yeah. so we went we literally set up the thing and put the mics on and we talked and then that was the interview that you saw okay so you guys started working together at that point point. and like i said you did the brunch you know you're working with them in various capacities and then the fashion show happens so more context we okay. do the brunch the brunch comes about because my whole goal is to move culture, have black journalists be have an equitable experience on the red carpet, be able to do their thing. So I say to him, this is what I'm doing. And he's asking me about me, and this is what I'm telling him I want to do. I want to move the culture forward. I want to be, you know, blah, blah, blah. So he says to me, I need to repair my relationship with the culture because of I've had moments and the red hat that he apologized for and all those kind of things. I said, look. He never apologized for that red hat. In my interview, he said. Oh, he did? Yeah, he did. He oh, did. okay. And right. so well, that's where I thought, that's the Kanye that we've all been looking for. Cause I really felt the culture was looking for permission to like him again. Cause everybody loved Kanye. You have Yeezys on, I have Yeezys, like right. everybody loves Kanye. Yeah. So I said, uh, okay, we're sharing ideas and we're, we're disagreeing on some things and agreeing on other things. And But for the most part, he says he wants to build this thing called Donda where one of those pillars will be a media arm where he can acquire media companies to be able to push culture and create narratives that drive the inter and future interests of black people. I'm like, damn, that's great. And he said, I would love you to be the head of that. What an honor. Of course, it's Kanye. We don't agree on everything politically. He believes in pro-life. I believe in pro-choice. He wore the red hat. I don't even own a red hat. We just don't see the same those ways, but we also had such a spirited dialogue with each other every time we talked in person or on the phone that he knew I wasn't going to be a yes man. And he respected that and I loved him for that. So fast forward, once he asked me to sit as the head of Donda for media, I put my, I said, look, I'll do it, but I need my paperwork and I need my payment. Did that and Hollywood Unlocked is going to be Hollywood Unlocked. So we're not going to always agree with you. He agreed to all that. So then I took on the role and the idea was that there would be this money developed in order to be able to execute on all these different things. So we already, we got into conversations with different companies to acquire and, you know, started building the relationships. And that's how the media brunch came together and really pulled together some of the most powerful black journalists and black storytellers and network leaders to create that conversation, which was going to be the beginning. And then the future happened. Right. So... He comes out to this fashion show with a White Lives Matter shirt. Yes. 
With him is Candace Owens. Correct. Wearing the same shirt. Uh, Lauren Hill's daughter is also there wearing that same shirt. You went on Instagram. I don't know exactly the timing of this, but you said, I love Ye as a person. I support free speech, but this is gaslighting black people and empowering white supremacy. Not sure if he has any friends left to tell him, but this is utterly disappointing. I'm going to exercise free speech and say nobody black has ever said that white lives don't matter. But when black people do this, it just screams the need for white validation. Not to mention adding Candace Owens to his photo is beyond rep reprehensible. I understand he believes in her right to free speech, but her speech is typically embedded in self-hate, a determination to promote white supremacy, and she lacks integrity. This is sad. Right. Was that the moment that you stepped away from Kanye? So I had officially quit two weeks before because I- Wait, before the White Lives Matter? Yes. Okay, why? Because I saw where this was going. Aha. Uh -huh. um, when, when I got in, um, I was never a fan of attacking everybody on social media. Because to me, I look at Kanye the way Kanye says he sees Kanye. Meaning, I look at Kanye as you're a cultural icon. You are a massive figure in our community. You represent the ability to become a self-made billionaire. You you grew through things that a lot of us still struggle with in our communities. Mm -hmm. And you could really be the pillar for our culture. That's who I see him as. And that's who he believes he is, but he doesn't always align with how he executes his stuff to be with what that narrative is. My job was to help drive the narrative and control the narrative and, and help him understand the landscape of the media and how it works and uh, making sure he has the right PR team and put him with the right people. He, at one point, was surrounded by a dynamic team of people. And I would never publicly say that if I didn't believe it, but he really was. Lawyers, brand leaders, uh, just school people, everybody. But Steve Jobs, who he aspires to be like, surrounded himself by brilliant people that he listened to. And that, I think, was the missing component for Kanye. And so when he knew that I was on a yes man, he stopped calling, stopped listening, stopped, you know. But then when crisis would happen, he would want to know how to fix it, how to manage it. And it, it was just this constant in crisis thing for me that wasn't about building. It was about putting out fires all the time. And I wanted to build because I saw the immense opportunity. I met with Gap and Adidas. I knew their commitment to wanting to invest in the community, to invest in the school, to give money and resources, to help bring ideas alive. I, I was at the table when these people were saying how much they wanted to help. But you got to be able to allow your team to get you the help they want to give you, right? And I don't feel that we were ever able to give that opportunity. So once I saw that that's what it was, I was humbled by the idea that he tapped me to be the person, but knew that I wasn't able to be successful because I wasn't given the ability to. And so instead of taking the hit and looking like I was a part of this train wreck, I got off, you know, and not in a way where I would, I'm never gonna bash him because, you know, those opportunities don't come every day. So I'm grateful for that. But at the same time, if you go back to my fighting for the union, fighting for the kids in juvenile hall, fighting for Trayvon Martin, fighting for Black Lives Matter, you understand what I stand for. And anytime they anybody, whether they black or white, push white supremacy, I'm going to speak out against it. And I felt that that photo, while there may be some artistic explanation for it, standing next to Candace Owens, going on an interview with Tucker Carlson, um, saying that Black Lives Matter is a, is a scam, I don't really understand that. Well, afterwards, after the whole White Lives Matter thing and everyone's upset and so forth, uh, he says some things about Diddy. He posts text messages and says something about, you know, Diddy and the Jews. So his Instagram ends up getting locked out, I think. So he goes to Twitter. He goes to Twitter and, you know, Elon Musk was like, welcome back, my friend. And everyone's happy and so forth. And then he tweets, I'm a bit sleepy tonight, but when I wake up, I'm going death con three on Jewish people. The funny thing is, I actually can't be anti-Semitic because black people are actually Jews also. You guys have toyed with me and tried to blackball anyone who ever opposes your agenda. At which point that tweet gets shut down, removed. And his whole Twitter account gets suspended or locked out, I guess. And um, 
I guess he ended up going and doing an interview on The Shop, LeBron's show on HBO. Uh, ahead of time, they said it was going to be a constructive talk. And, you I know, facilitated and so forth. that interview. Oh, you facilitated that interview. I did. And they've been trying to interview him for a long time. And I felt that him doing the interview would be important to the culture because I love LeBron and what he stands for, and I love the shop. And it usually is a share a, a sharing of ideas. Um, they knew who they were getting, though. You know what I mean? And they knew the what was happening at the time in the press. But maybe they believed by giving him the platform, he would pivot or do something different. But the one thing about Ye is he's going to show up as who he is, and he's very unapologetic about it. You know, and you know, I want to say something about the anti-Semitism comments and stuff because I have diff- a lot of various views on this. I'm on Wild and Out with Nick Cannon. Nick Cannon went through something similar on Viacom. He was able to get Wild and Out back. I don't understand, and this is me just really not understanding, why there's a heightened sensitivity around having conversations about the Jewish community, but when he says white lives matter, white people were mad. Like, white people should have been mad at that too. I feel like, the comments he said about the Jewish community and the comments he said about White Lives Matter were both wrong. But there wasn't cancel Kanye when he was saying White Lives Matter. He did post after post after post. He went after Diddy. He went after other black figureheads. He went after the black writer from Vogue. He talked about her boots. He attacked the fashion community. He attacked Gigi Hadid. He attacked Haley Bieber. He attacked Justin Bieber. He, he called Black Lives Matter as a scam. I mean, he did all of that and there wasn't this outrage until he said the word. Jew. And I don't know, because I haven't looked at it all, to say why, but I do understand the frustration, at least from Black people, that when Black people are talked about, there isn't equal anger and frustration. You have Sharon Osbourne, her old ass, popping up on the side of Rodeo Drive. Now, we know paparazzi how it works. It don't work like it used to now with social media. You got to plan that paparazzi shot. Mm -hmm. She planned that shit, one camera, she wants a refund because she says Black Lives Matter is a scam. Well, first of all, this is the same woman whose daughter said that if Trump got rid of all the Mexicans, who would clean the toilets? That's one. She's the same white woman who got let go from the talk because she backed Piers Morgan when he was critical of Meghan Markle. She's had racial issues in her family publicly for a long time. But nobody will talk about that because she's too old and she might die of a heart attack. I don't know. Fuck Sharon Osbourne. But let me say this. I, I find it ironic that Sharon did all of that and that nobody has criticized her because I think we, you know, when, when she says she wants a refund, it's because she's going off of what Ye said with Black Lives Matter being a scam. And this is where I say Ye is blind because to condemn the office of Black Lives Matter when there's an, when Black Lives Matter is an ideology that Black Lives Matter too to condemn the office because of scandal is to condemn Christianity because a pastor drives a Bentley or fucks somebody in their congregation. You can't condemn the ideology that Black Lives Matter too because the office has problems. But for him to do that, gaslit white supremacists, and that's why Sharon Osbourne was comfortable to say she wants a refund. You're attacking the ideology because it's safe now because Kanye made it safe, and it's not safe. And there's people out there, and I said on my show last night, there are mothers buying Yeezys for their little black boys who are going to school and getting killed um, at the hands of white people, unarmed, um, and uh, and 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 they they believe in you, and you have to believe in your words enough to understand how powerful they are. And there's nobody around him now, in my opinion, that are telling him that. Well, I think you know I'm Jewish myself. The problem I had with that tweet was the DeathCon three, yeah, thing. You know what I mean? And coming from a history of six million Jews wiped out, you know, parts of my family were wiped out. You know, my Jewish relatives were wiped out during World War II. Saying Death Con 3 to a group that has lost so much, you know, it's not like he said Death Con 3 on white people. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I think that would have been, you know what I'm saying? I don't think it's really apples to apples. He was just saying white lives matter as sort of a, I understand why he was saying it, it was like a, a parody of but black, to black lives pe- matter. But to black people, they would disagree because to black people, we're in Death Con 3 every day. Yeah, fair enough. You know, like Fair I, enough, 20 million, you know, Black people died during the slave trade and everything else like that. I, I get it. I, I was I was very, you know, when I saw White Lives Matter, I thought it was lame. Yeah. Uh, I thought having Candace Owens up there was lame. I've said this in interviews. I've said it publicly. Yeah. You know, I also think this anti-Jewish tweet was lame as well. Yeah. Um, you know, and LeBron, you know, HBO show The Shop ended up pulling the interview over hate speech and d- dangerous stereotypes. You know, listen, I know people around Kanye 
without going into any names that have been around him for years and years. And what, what they say is that every few months, Kanye just switches up his whole crew, mm-hmm. right? He'll have all these people around him. And then six months later, all those people will be gone. And there's a whole new group of people. Mm-hmm. Because I've heard that too. Yeah, because at the end of the day, He's a multi-billionaire and he's a money maker and there's always going to be someone to step up and want to be around him. Mm-hmm. Certain people like yourself will walk away. There will be a new Jason Lee to replace sure. you, sure. right? You yeah. know, no offense to Jason yeah, Lee, yeah, but there'll yeah. be another Jason Lee to fill that role sure. in Kanye's life. Sure. Yeah. Well, well, let me say this, and, and I want to be very clear. I don't think there should be a negotiation between which statement was more painful because yeah. white lives, the Jewish comments, Black Lives Matter now is a scam. Slavery is a choice. Harriet Tubman didn't free the slaves. Uh, I mean, Pat Lathan even came forward and said that during that whole uh, the whole thing with TMZ, he said that he he loves Hitler or something. Yeah, let me let me me finish my thought. I think that any group of people who are marginalized or who have had a history of pain have the right to feel how they feel. Yeah, and I don't think that it's fair to say anyone is wrong. I just feel like there is an inequity in the handing out of cancellation when it comes to certain groups. And as somebody who's black and white, I'm not Jewish, but I love everybody. And some of the first people to support me when I started my company was Jewish people who brought me into, we would go to dinner and it was like, oh, you don't have a car? You ain't get, they literally dropped the car off to my house. Like they looked at out for me in a way that my community had. I'm Jewish, I reached out to you. You did reach out to me and you yeah. didn't take me to dinner. I think you paid the bill too. Right. Um, no, but you know, I feel like that I'm not angry at him. I'm disappointed. You know, I'm disappointed because I did spend seven months investing in the idea that mm-hmm. this was going to be something different. I I invested time in a person who I believe wanted to do a certain thing for the culture. But I also have compassion for this person because, you know, I don't believe that when somebody that you have a relationship with goes through something that you automatically just use that as an opportunity to stand on grandstand on them and shit on them. You know, I want him to be great. I don't know that he wants to be great because how he acts doesn't align with wanting to be great. And um, I was saying this also on my show that I think that in some weird way, when he says white lives matter, and when he posts a picture of his hat running for president in 2024, and he gets everybody wrapped up in this potential run for presidency, that if he was to lose the presidency, he would say, Trump did everything and won, but I didn't. I told you white lives matter. So the joke would be on us. That's his Mm. thinking. And I get it, but I also understand the power of words and how they land and what's happening now is not helping us to understand that because the context is missing, but that's how he thinks. Yeah, I mean, from my point of view, the way I saw it, and I may be wrong because I don't know Kanye like that. I've interviewed him once many, many years ago before Vlad TV. It almost appeared to me that he upset so many black people with White Lives Matter that from him making statements about the Jewish community and knowing that there's somewhat of a tense relationship between blacks and Jews, that in a way it got some of the heat from the black community, and now you have black people that are agreeing with, oh yeah, you know, because because Jews did, you know, we are really the real Jew, you know, black people really are the real Jews, and the Jews really did finance the slave trade, and all these conspiracy theories, and and so forth. Oh, the Jews do control everything, and always try to blackball us, and so forth. And to me, it's just like, ah, oh, man, I, I wish it could have just been done a, a different way. Well, well, let me say this because I want to be sensitive to everybody watching, right? Because you have a huge audience. Um, some people who believe they are conspiracy theories really believe it happened, yeah. right? And the people who family went through certain experiences understand what happened. And I'm not taking a side on either side. I don't want to be seen as somebody who's saying the blacks were the first Jews or Jewish people. Like, I'm not in that well, conversation. Who knows? Yeah. And, and, I, but, but, and, and but, to but, me, but, it doesn't matter anyway. Wait, but let me say you know this, because I, I, I think it's, it's important for me to get this out there. Yeah. I don't, I'm not playing in that, right? And I, I think like with him, Putting stuff online allows so many conversations to happen. First, it's white lives matter, then all the black people are mad, then the Jewish comments, now black people are not mad, and now Jewish people are mad, and now right. everybody online is fighting with each other. Right. And the chaos is unnecessary. Exactly. And I don't know what the end goal is. And that's why I go back to my point where I said, I don't know if he has people around him that actually care about him Ooh. to say, yeah, come on, nah. Because if I was in the room, I would say, nah, we're not doing that. Because I believe in who he could be. Yeah, I mean, Elon Musk said that they spoke and he felt like it was a, uh, you know, a fruitful conversation. But I guess the thing with the shop happened afterwards and I guess yeah, <laughs> it I wasn't a fruitful conversation. So, so it, is, it is what it is. And then what's interesting afterwards 
is that Candace Owens pops up with a voicemail of Kim Kardashian, you know, allegedly to Ray J. And actually, I, I know someone close to the Kim situation who's known her for many, many years. And this person said, oh, that's definitely Kim. Mm-hmm. 100%. Oh, I mean, it sounds like Kim. But, yeah. but here... Okay. It, was, it wasn't a fake voicemail, is what so I'm saying. So I understand a couple of things. I understand Ray J is upset with the Kardashians because they've shit on him for a long time and made him out to be the bad guy that leaked this sex tape that he now is saying that they had some participation in selling. And, and let, let me just let me just touch on this point yes. because there, there's a lot of gray area about this. But I actually interviewed the owner of Vivid Entertainment, and in our interview, this is this is right here on Vlad TV YouTube. He said when they first got the sex tape, they got paperwork and they found out that the paperwork, one of the names on the paperwork was forged. Well, it was brought to us uh, by a third party. Uh, felt like the proper paperwork that we needed was in place that came along with it. Now that ultimately wasn't the case, but um, we went out there and said, look, we feel comfortable releasing this movie. Ultimately, we were able to have a conversation with Kim after much back and forth and and lots of legal stuff going on. But ultimately, she agreed to allow us to put out the tape. We paid her several million dollars. It was an amazing investment for us. And I think it worked out pretty good for her as well. Um, But ultimately, yes, we need to get an agreement. I assumed just because usually men are the ones who bring forward sex tapes that oh oh Ray J brought it he he forged Kim's name. No, in fact, we find out afterwards after Ray J posts the paperwork and everything, which coincides with my interviews, that Kim actually forged Ray J's name on that paperwork. So look how mad Ray J is right now. Like I just had Ray J hosted Ray J at the Revolt Conference in, in Atlanta where we talked about it. He just went on the Charlemagne show over on Viacom. Now, they're not going to tell you this, but I'll tell you. He spilled everything on that show and got a lot of, the network got a lot of pressure from the Kardashians, allegedly, and they edited it all out. So it never, you know? And so Ray J is really angry. He's angry that his sister hasn't stepped up to defend him. She's been silent. Brandy hasn't said anything. She just had a stroke, by the way. I know. uh, Seizure. Seizure. Yeah, I know. I, 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 I'm sorry about that, but you know, but this is how Ray J feels, right? And so he feels like this constant need to expose who these people are. I'm not saying he leaked this audio tape, but if he got the voicemail, I don't know who else got it. Uh, I think that if he was the one that leaked it, I don't think he would bring it to Candace Owens. I, but that's the part that doesn't make Candace sense. Candace Owens was the first one to say that Kim Kardashian was a prostitute. She went after Kim before that. I don't know who released it. But what I'm saying is that. And let me just say this we don't. Wait, wait, we posted. Wait, wait, let me, we posted. I, we're not going to say that Kim Kardashian was a prostitute. Wait, wait. Okay? I, we'll, we'll just, I, no, let I me said, say that, 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 you know, if that's a rumor, I'd never heard about on, it before. And, and well, I, don't, I don't know of any truth in that. I'm well, not trying to get sued by the Kardashians. Well, here's the deal fuck their lawsuits. But what I'm saying is that they're, I'm not saying Kim Kardashian is a prostitute. I'm saying Candace Owens said, on her platform uh, that gotcha. she was a, a prostitute. Okay. Just to be clear. <laughs> um, what she was saying was that Chris Jenner brokering the deal that Ray J said was brokered made her a prostitute and made Kent Chris the pimp. That's what Candace said. I don't, I don't know that to be true. I wasn't okay. there. I can see how you're sort of, fra- you could frame that in that such a way. I mean... I'm just saying what the people say. I'm not, I, I'm right. not, I don't know what, who was in the room of Vivid or whatever. But what I will say is that them leaking the audio tape about the Whitney Houston thing did nothing because it just people online were like, so what? We don't care. Nobody well, cared. I think it sort of showed a side of Kim that you've never seen before. Kim has always controlled her image so well that even when you watch Keeping Up with the Kardashians or the Hulu show or whatever, she's always seen as this really nice, pleasant. To people that aren't paying attention, she's 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 supporting Rick Caruso for L.A. Mayor. She don't live in L.A. This billionaire who has not been qu- close to Karen Bass, who's fought to get people out of mass, fought against mass incarceration for years, who's been the chair of the uh, the the Congressional Black Caucus, who helped me get a person out of prison who was arrested for marijuana, hmm. who brokered a deal with another governor of the state. You're endorsing this white billionaire who's not even aligned with what you're doing for our culture. So like people who are paying attention are getting it. 
Yeah, I'm paying I mean, attention. Listen, I personally thought that Kanye had this video. I mean, had this recording and gave it to Candace, considering they have a relationship. I don't know. That's my is. guess, but I don't know. Who don't knows? Know. Let Whitney Houston lay in peace. I don't know. Maybe yeah, she the fact that she called Whitney a crackhead and, and everything else like that. and No, the fact that she recited song lyrics. Yeah. The, it's, it's not, not right, right, but, but it's, it's okay. okay. I mean, Someone pointed that out to me. I'm like, yo, I'm dying right now. Yeah. I'm dying. It was, we it don't was. know. I talked to someone who knows her very well, and he goes... Same kind of thing, starts off nice and sweet, and I've gotten these same type of voicemails, and it starts to escalate into this crazy, you know, screaming and whatever. He goes, yeah, you know, that's, and, and I, that's and definitely her. And I'm like, okay. And I'll have to say, as much, as much as I've been critical of Kim, and will always be critical of whoever we were talking about at the time and whatever they're doing, I mean, I also met her, and she's also been very nice, you know, and she's very, you know, but again, I, you, I don't know these people the way that they know each other. I don't know Kim the way Ray J or Kanye does. I just know her from, you know, a couple times that we met. Yeah, man. And uh, you had the Impact Awards. I did. Very impressive. Thank you. Especially the star power that showed up. Yeah. Uh, congratulations on that, man. I know something like that is very hard to pull off, especially a live event of that stature with getting the type of people to actually show up when you have all these established, you know, whether it's the Grammys, the Oscars, the BT Awards, the Billboard Awards, there's usually huge organizations that go behind it. Yeah, it was like five of us. Yeah, exactly. It was five of us. And, you know, um, shout out to Mariah Carey, who was the easiest to get there. I mean, wow. she was okay. like, you know, people talk about Mariah being a diva. She wants this and she wants that. She was not that. She was very easy. Um, she came and she surprised Floyd, who's a friend of hers. And, um, you know, I just called her and she said, yeah, but I mean, everybody showed up. Lizzo, who I didn't have a relationship with before, had never met her before, but we see each other from Instagram and support each other. She showed up and honored her and Khalees and Floyd and Jennifer Lewis. So it was, it was good. It was, it was, um, definitely something that we're now shopping. We're going to air it on our YouTube channel. Um, just. Oh, so, never got, never got a No, podcast. we're going to air oh, okay. it tonight, actually, I think. Oh, dope. Yeah, we're airing it tonight so people can see it. And, uh, but now we're, we're talking to brands, we're talking to networks works and we're, we're in the conversation about where it's going to air next year i mean i don't say this very often because you just mentioned lizzo as someone who has a very male oriented platform you know 90 percent of my audience is male i really want to say that the way people are talking about lizzo and her weight you know from kanye to whoever else really is just very sexist mm -hmm. because you got dj khaled who's posting videos of him eating 10 course meals and, and, and lobsters and he's heavier than she is. No one says anything about Khaled. Mm. Kanye shows up on Khaled's album, mm. but everyone wants to focus on Lizzo and so forth, which I think is just unfair. Well, and, and I think it's sexist. Well, I love Khaled a lot and I love Lizzo a lot. Both of them are really nice people. We live in a world where men believe they can say a woman has no right to have an abortion. Like we live in a world where men predominantly old white men in this country tell women what to do with their body all the time. I said on my show last night, a woman's body is her choice. If Lizzo wants to be overweight, skinny, if she wants to have the surgery I have or not, she's beautiful. However, she is, but her confidence is what made us give her the fearlessness award. And I really feel like it's easy for them to do it because if you go after Khaled, you know, Khaled's nice and stuff on social media, but we all know Khaled, Khaled in these streets. There's other consequences if you go after Khaled. Hey, Kelly. Um, and you ain't gonna do that. But Kelly's a nice person. Minding knows his business. Same with Lizzo. Why they do it? Because she's a woman and they're sexist. I agree. Yep. There you go. <laughs> now you have a new show coming. The Jason Lee Show. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm investing. What, what platform is it coming out on? So we're, first we were gonna go to one platform, but then we started getting all these other offers. So we're taking our time. That's why the rollout has been so delayed. And everybody's mm -hmm. like, just release, release it. And I'm like, you know, I wanna release it when we have the right deal. And the right deal for me means the right amount of money, but also marketing and support. So uh, I'm saying that um, as of right now, we're gonna start shooting in December and top of the year, we're gonna go back to Fox Soul for sure, but we're looking at another network to partner and do a double network deal that they've never done before to make sure that it's aired in two different places. Um, and then we're talking to all the major streamers. Um, and right now it's just really about who's gonna put the right marketing behind it because I want the billboards, I want the pre-roll ads, I want all of the social uh, value. And I also want the money, I want the fucking money. <laughs> I work hard to do it, you know, to build what I wanna build. But like, I'm calling every relationship I have to get every name. And it's not just big name, it's big conversation too, because the thing I love like about your interviews, you know, you'll interview, I'll see you be interviewing some of the biggest names, but then you'll interview some of the most viral conversations. I mean, that's really the world that we live in and that's what I want to do but in a way that's funny 
um, and and very blunted. And um, I'm, I've learned a lot too that with the Jason Lee show, you know, people want to hear what I have to say, but I have to say it in a way that they can get it. And I think it's it's learning from like a Kanye. Like you have a message, but your delivery is just not landing with people. Yeah. Shit. So I'm hoping with the Jason Lee show that um, they receive it well. Hey man, listen, I've been a long time supporter. Thank you. you and I go back four or five years at this point. Uh, and I've always liked to see the next generation come up and I've always liked to reach out and form relationships with people that are doing something similar. I never see people as competition. Me you know, I've always found it funny when other media outlets want to beef with me and talk shit about me on their platforms. I'm like, this is dumb. We could do better working together. This is why my relationship with academics is so good. Adam 22 is so good. I have a relationship with Charlemagne. You know, um, it's so crazy you say that because you know what? I'm going to show you my phone before I leave. These courses that I have coming out to teach people, I have you, Adam 22, and um, academics that I want to invite to a conversation. I swear to God, because people believe that what we do we have to be competitive when we can be collaborative. You literally built your own lane. Nobody can get in your lane. It's yours. Mm -hmm. Academics built his. Adam yeah. 22 has his. You all may talk about the same people. We all may talk about the same people. We all got our own thing. Right. And, and, and I feel like like when you call me, it's always out of love and it's always out of respect. I feel yeah. the respect. Same with Robin from Ball Alert or Angie from Sharon. I don't hate for anybody. I want everybody to be able to be successful. And I kind of feel like when people are threatened, it's because you don't believe in yourself. Mm. If you believe in, it has nothing to do with you. Right. Like I don't look at, I look at your YouTube and go, this motherfucker got goddamn, look at all these goddamn followers in this, you know? And you talk about the numbers you're making, the money making, I'm like, goddamn Vlad, give me the, give me the, the skills. But I don't hate on that. I, it motivates me to want to figure it out. And our conversation about content has never been, it's always been from a, how you can support me, how I can support you. And, right. and I feel like if we have more of that, you know, um, especially like if somebody comes after you or comes after me and we can all come together, it's like we have a certain level of integrity to the work we have to do that doesn't have to be pointed against one another. Yeah, and we also all benefit when we do each other's platforms. You know what I'm saying? It's sort of like, you did my platform. If you want me to do yours, no problem. Uh, me and uh, academics, we sort of alternate. I'll do his show on Spotify and then he'll come and do my show. I, I just did oh, I Adam's show. To, I would love to do that. Yeah, you know, I, I just did No Jumper recently, and then Adam's going to come do Vlad TV. Uh, I did Breakfast Club. I did Brilliant Idiots. Nice. And then, you know, Charlamagne's going to come do my show again. Andrew okay, Schultz. So you're going to do the Jason Lee show. I got And you. I get to flip the table yeah. and do my thing. Okay, Yeah, cool. of course, man. And that's, and that's how we all win. So to all the outlets out there that are hating on me, you, whoever else, Charlemagne, academics, like, y'all are really missing out. Because we're all cool people. Like we all want to win and we could all win together and we could win together a lot faster if we're working together. You know, if I interview someone and someone hits me up and say, hey, can you give me this contact? Sure. You know, I'm not going to guarantee they're going to do it, yeah. <laughs> but I'll give you the contact. Well, can you tell Boosie I want to interview him? Sure. <laughs> Wait, can I say something else? I don't know if you're talking about Peter Rosenberg because he's the only motherfucker that hated on me. I'm going to say it on your show. Uh, Peter, I saw that you're on Drink Champs recently and they brought up that I said that your dog was fucking ugly and uglier than my dogs. Your dog probably is uglier than my dogs, but I do accept your apology because it was somewhat of an apology. You don't want to say you're sorry, even though you email me and say you want to talk. I accept your apology. I'm not coming on your shit show, but no more beef. <laughs> Jason Lee, man, congrats on what you pulled off. It's Thank not you. easy. There's a lot of uh, media outlets that came and went. Uh, you know, some of the, the Concrete dopest. Loop. Concrete Loop. Uh, now Right was, was this really dope outlet when I first started. You know, he was one of my early supporters. Uh, there's been a lot. Funk, Funk Master Flex had his own had his own platform. I mean, now, this now is he 50. Has, now he has a platform now. Funk Flex's platform is in our comments. Okay, there you go. Uh, I mean, the... the uh, who else? This is Fifty was a yeah, big platform yeah. when Fifty was really putting a lot of motivation, you know, uh, you know, money and so you know, into it. Not to say that I mean they're still around, but it's like it's hard to really do this year after year and still stay hot and still stay relevant but look, but look and still at, go viral. But look at you, consistency. Like consistency. you have to be obsessed with it. It has to be. Yes. You have to be determined yes. to want to do it and know that there's no other choice. Yeah, and you also have to be fearless because in the process of doing this, you're going to get attacked. I didn't you know, know you got attacked as much as you did shit. until like until we started developing our relationship. I'm shit. like, let me go see what DJ Vlad doing because you're so nice on the phone. I'm like, damn, y'all hating on Vlad. 
I've, I've been canceled before. I've been called the feds. There's been fake stories about me and so forth. But the thing is, you just put your head down and you work and you work every day. And that was the thing with Vlad TV. In, in 2008, I said, every day we're going to drop a new clip. Everyone thought it was stupid. Fast forward to 2022, that's what everyone's doing. And, and you know, you just have to really say, okay, some things you put out there is going to flop. And some things are going to go super viral. And there's going to be everything in between. But as long as you keep getting up at bat and you keep, you know, hitting that ball over and over and over again, year after year, you build up that fan base, you build up that viewership, you build up those relationships and so forth, you will eventually win. And it's taken me a lot of years. It's taken you a lot of years. All the other people, it's taken them a lot of years. But I can't imagine doing anything else at this point in my Maybe. life, man. So appreciate you coming in, man. Wish you all the best. Of course. Thank you. Peace.